Joining me today is an entrepreneur, a venture capitalist, an author, the co-founder of PayPal, the first outside investor in Facebook, the founder of Palantir, and Silicon Valley's ultimate contrarian thinker, Peter Thiel, finally welcome to The Rubin Report. David, thanks for having me on the show. It's good to be here with you. I normally don't have this many cards for a guest, but uh, I've got a lot of cards for you today. Are you ready to roll? Ready to go. All right, so we have to start, obviously. Uh, Rogan had Elon Musk on last week, last week and uh, they smoked a joint. So do you want me to put the joint on the table right now, or how are we doing this? You know, my, my number one rule is uh, never to compete with Elon in anything. So, <laughs> so I think uh, I'll, you know, I, I, would never, I would never bet against Elon. Uh, it, it's uh, it's been like this. Uh, you know, I've been I, I, I was a close partner of his at PayPal in the in the, uh, in the late '90s, early 2000s, and uh, and uh, after PayPal, you know, Elon set out to start these two, the, you know, both the rocket company and the uh, the uh, electric car company, SpaceX and Tesla. Yeah. And I think the conventional wisdom on Elon was that, that these were both completely harebrained projects. You know, if one of them had succeeded. Um, that you have to sort of question it. You know, when both of them succeeded, it suggests that you know he knows something people other people don't. All right. Well, in that it case, it can't be a matter of luck. I'll if keep you, I'll keep the joint right here for now. But so, I don't compete with Elon. All right, but let's that that's a good place to start because first, you know, it's interesting because we've gotten to know each other a little bit in the last couple of years, and it seems to me that the person that I know privately is sort of different than the the way the media portrays you. So I thought maybe at the beginning, let's just do a little history about you, and then we can get to some of the controversies and some of the ideas that you're really interested and things like that. So let's start with with PayPal since you mentioned it already. Where did the idea of PayPal first come from? Well, you know, it's, it's when, when you start one of these companies, uh, it's, it's typically not the case that you get the whole idea fully formed, you know, instantaneously. We, we certainly, uh, there, there was this incredible internet boom going on in Silicon Valley in the late 90s. It felt that there was sort of this open frontier, open gold rush. One of the natural things to look at was you know was finance? I, I was sort of very interested in the cryptocurrency. Could there be new forms of money? There's always something you know super uh, uh, mysterious, powerful, important about money, and it was was it was there a way that this this was going to change? So we had, I think we had this general idea to do something with security, with money, with payments uh, from very early on uh, of the founding of the company, and then you iterate a lot on how to how to get the idea out. And the, the critical question for any consumer internet product is always not what the idea is, but how do you get it out? How do you get the distribution out? And we spent, there have been a lot of payments companies, internet payments companies that, have, that already started and failed by 1998. There was one called, um, uh, one, uh, one called uh, well, there was Cybercash. There were, you know, there, there, there's sort of um, a variety of these different ones that have tried to create these, you know, comprehensive currency schemes um, and they would work if everybody used them, but you could never get even the first person to start. And so <laughs> right. the, the, the challenge was how to make it viral. How do you get something to work where it's good for the first person, for the 10th person, for the 100th person? You know, once you have millions of people, you have a network, you have network effects. And that was sort of the chicken and egg problem. Yeah, so how did you guys overcome that hurdle? Well, we eventually stumbled on this idea of uh, linking money with email because there were already 300 million people in 99 that had email accounts. And, uh, and so if you could send money um, to an email address, you know, I'd, um, I'd send it to your email, and then you'd get an email saying you've received cash, and then you'd obviously cl click on the links and do the work necessary to get the money out. And, yeah. so, um, and so you didn't need both counterparts to a transaction to be part of the PayPal network. Only the sender could be part of it, and then the recipient, um, the recipient would sign up as they took the money out. And, uh, and then uh, we started with the 24 people in our office. Those were the first 24 customers. And they sent money to friends and to other people. We gave these referral bonuses. We gave you $10 if you signed up, and $10 if you got someone to sign up. And it just uh, grew exponentially. When we were, you know, uh, it grew about 7 to 10% compounding daily. And wow. if you're, you know, uh, and even if you start with a small number, if you can get 7 to 10% daily compounding, you know, after about a month, you're at 1,000 people. By uh, that was mid November of '99. By end of uh, December of '99, it was at uh, 12,000. By February 3rd, 2000, it was at 100,000. By mid April 2000, it was up to a million. And so, so what did you do in terms of getting people to understand the way you could 
uh, work with money differently? Because I actually remember the first time I used PayPal. I think it was in 2001. I was a struggling comic. I had moved into a roommate's uh, little apartment because I didn't have much money, and I but I had to pay him a couple hundred bucks or something a month for uh, for rent. And he, I was going to give him a check. He said, "PayPal me." And the just the idea that I was somehow linking my bank account to something on the computer. At, we didn't even have. I don't know, if I'm not mistaken, I think I was still using dial-up. I don't even know that we you know, had, had Wi-Fi or anything like that. But it's about an idea that this can even happen. How did you train people to realize that well, it's always, this is something that's real and it's you can always, use it? Um, you, it's, it's, it's normally you sort of to get people to start doing something like that, it has to be something where there's an intense need and, um, and maybe it's not too dangerous. And so the, you know, one of the natural places it started was on the eBay auction site where you had small dollar transactions, maybe $40 was the typical amount. And uh, if you send check across the country, that's like a seven to 10 delay, ten day delay, it's mm -hmm. slow. Um, most, most people aren't set up to process credit cards. Your roommate probably couldn't process credit cards. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so you, if, but since you could make PayPal payments with a credit card, you could in effect send a credit card payment to um, 300 million people, whereas there are only something like three or four million that are set up to process. Uh, um, there are like 150 million people with emails in the US at the time, mm -hmm. and there may be three million that were set up to process credit cards, small businesses, things like that. So we expanded it by you know 147 million. Do you remember what it felt like as it started compounding the way you're talking about? Well, like it was, what it, it was, felt like as it was growing and you realized like, wow, we really have this thing. Well, you now. are you know you're at the at the at the forefront of like some sort of revolutionary thing. It uh, it's incredibly uh, exciting and it's incredibly scary. And it was uh, it was like we're gonna take over the world. Or we're all gonna die. And you, <laughs> you move several times between you know um, that those two uh, several times a day. Yeah. Was uh, there any bizarre pushback from banks or any anyone that was doing well, financial was, tra were, transactions you know, there, traditionally? It, there were cer certainly like. More than more than our share of challenges, you had a you had an enormous problem of fraud, where people just uh, figured out ways to hack the system and steal money, mm -hmm. and then um, and you can't simply get rid of fraud because you can always get rid of fraud if you make it cumbersome. But if it's easy, then it's also easy to defraud. And so sure. the challenge was how do you get it to be easy to use but hard to defraud, and that took you know, took some time. There um, certainly uh, banks didn't like it. There were you know there were all the the incumbent players that that didn't like something new. And then, of course, it was sort of in this um, in this uh, strange regulatory zone where uh, you know it was a new form of payments, a new form of moving money, and uh, and you know I, the, the way I often thought of it at the time was that we were in a race between technology and politics, and you know the politicians didn't like us, but if we got the system, the PayPal network to be big enough, it would sort of overwhelm the regulators. And they'd have to accept it as a as a fait accompli. So the libertarian part of you must have loved that concept. Yeah, like no, you were actually doing something that libertarians are supposed sure, was, to do. You know, there was a, an early two thousand conversation. Uh, you know, one of the one of the execs at uh, PayPal said that you know, we need to hire a whole bunch of lawyers to <laughs> tell us what we what we can do or can't do. And said, no, we're not going to hire them. They'll just they'll tell us what we can't do. So we have to just go ahead and not hire the lawyers and just just do it. Yeah. Now you know the the sort of. Uh, I, I actually I do not know if a company like PayPal could have been started even two three years later. So you know in the in the aftermath of 9/11, we got the Patriot Act in the U.S. and that uh, that attached you know much more regulatory scrutiny to uh, to financial transactions to payments. The know your customer rules became much much trickier, and so uh, so I do think that uh, there's a weird way in which there was an opening to start a business like PayPal in 1999 2000. Even uh, three years later, I, I think it might not have been possible. Yeah, and it's so cool to me just knowing a lot of your ideology and the libertarian ideas you care about and, and just going ahead and building what you want to build instead of waiting for other people to do it. I mean, you actually did it, and, and that's a pretty, it's a pretty great thing. Well, it was, it was, um, it was sort of the sen sense that you know, we were going to change the world. We're going to you know, um, give people more control over their money. We had all these ideas about you know getting rid of central banks and creating a new currency. We never quite you know got to the Bitcoin yeah. stage of it. But, we'll get to that later. But uh, but, but certainly uh, certainly these ideas were you know, were incredibly motivational in, in doing it. And it it is always a little bit of a contrast from you know I, I always have this um, view on politics where it's both you know incredibly important and then in many ways incredibly frustrating yeah. because uh, it's so. Um, it's like the air we breathe. It permeates our whole system, and then it's also so hard to, to ever change. And you know, as a you know, as a college student, I started you know this 
uh, conservative libertarian newspaper mm -hmm. at Stanford, the Stanford Review, and uh, and there's a lot. You know, it's important to have debates to discuss things, and then it's often so hard to uh, to change things. And the, the the PayPal hack was in a way, you know, we we're, we were going to change the world. We weren't going to ask for permission. We're, yeah, we're, you know, we're just tech technology over politics. Well, speaking of changing the world, let's flash forward a couple of years. So we're just doing some business background first before we get to a lot of your, your ideas of the day. Uh, you were the first outside investor in Facebook, 500 grand to this Zuckerberg guy. Did you know him well before that? Had you guys communicated a lot? How did that even come to pass? Not really, it was a sort of, actually literally the first day we met, we, we told oh, wow. him to leave for an hour, we came back and we, we, we gave him the term sheet about an hour later. So it was, wow. it was, a, it was a fast decision. Uh, I think I think people always have this sort of Shark Tank image of these things, with some sort of you know super sophisticated pitch, and you say just the right things, and right. That's, that's what works. And it was nothing of the sort. And he was a he was a you know kind of introverted nineteen year old uh, you know sophomore uh, between sophomore and junior year summer summer of two thousand four, and uh, and um, and the the main and and and, it, and, and the main thing I had going for it was it was just growing fast. They were, they were at something like 20 college campuses. They had about 100,000 people on the network and they just needed more money for computers because there was such demand for, for the product as they were going to launch it at more colleges in the fall. So is that what appealed to you more than the product itself? Just that you saw it, engagement it was with already, people? It was already working. Yeah. Um, and then, but I, I, I would say the other, the other par part of it was that there was like a prehistory to it. So. Uh, one of my uh, one of my good friends from PayPal, back from Stanford, this guy named Reed Hoffman, who mm -hmm. had, um, he started LinkedIn later years, but uh, and he'd worked with me at PayPal in the late '90s, early 2000s. But before that, um, he had started a social networking company back in 1997, seven years before Facebook, and they had they already had um, you know they had social net was the name of the company, so they had social networking in the name of the company seven years before huh. and there were all these things that they had they had thought about doing so it was going to be you know it was going to be um it was the 1990s version of social networking was we were going to have these avatars in cyberspace and i might be a cat and you might be a dog and i'd be a virtual cat and you're a virtual dog and we have to figure out how we relate and it turns out um people aren't weren't really interested in that they weren't really interested in some sort of fictional mm -hmm. online persona. It was much more about real identity, and uh, and somehow Facebook was the first one to crack the problem of real identity. Where you know, uh, even though it's always a little bit curated, certainly for the most part, people on Facebook are who they they say they are. Yeah, for the most part, at least. So, am I, am I mistaken? You're the only person who's been on the board of Facebook the entire way out, except for Mark, right? Right, right, since the beginning, yes. Yeah, Is, what can I ask you about that, that uh, Facebook won't get too angry about, if I ask you? Well, well, just what's the experience like of being, a, you're part of a board from the beginning of really the thing of the internet, what seems to drive conversation the most on the internet? Well, there's, um, you know, there's, I mean, it's it's been sort of like this incredible trajectory, you know, uh, where it's 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 gotten you know, probably much bigger than I would have thought possible at the time. Even though I was, you know, I was incredibly optimistic and bullish on it. Certainly back in uh, back in two thousand four, two thousand five. I think that uh, I think that one one kind of perspective for a lot of the world class entrepreneurs is they're not specialists. They're they're something close to polymaths, and so. Um, you know, if you have a conversation with uh, Mark Zuckerberg, he'd be able to speak, uh, you know, with with you know surprising amount of understanding about a lot of things. We so could speak about the details of the Facebook product. He could talk about, um, you know, the the, the way people th think about social media, the psychology, the uh, the, um, the the way the culture is shifting, the um, management of the company. He has ideas on that. He has ideas on. Um, and then how this fits into the bigger history of technology, and so it's uh, you know whereas where sort of an academic view is often that you're like a sort of a narrow expert on one thing, mm -hmm. and that's what you do, and and what it is about it's it's much more uh, sort of this this polymath like uh, intellect who understands all these different things, and so the the kinds of board conversations we've had over the last uh, you know t uh, 13, 14 years. Have uh, it's just been this, this this crazy range. Yeah, it must be particularly interesting for you though, as sort of the outsider in Silicon Valley. And we're going to talk about you, why you moved down to LA, and all that stuff. Uh, that you've 
been there the whole time. That it's not, you know, they didn't, for all the reasons that Silicon Valley may be what it is, you weren't ever booted off the board or anything like that. They've, they've let you be the contrarian guy there. So that, that actually must, that's a good thing about Silicon Valley, I suppose, um, or at least within the little microcosm that you sit in, right? No, I, I you know, I, I don't experience, you know, a great deal of hostility to me personally. You know, people, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's you, you just, uh, you, you always, uh, you know, it's, it's, it sort of manifests in all sorts of other ways. So I, th I do think Silicon Valley at this point has a bit of a conformity problem. It has, you know, a bit of a way in which people are, you know, too, too much all uh, thinking the same way. It's just like the, there was, you know, the, the Apple, I saw this, this meme on the internet the other day where it was sort of the uh, Silicon Valley 1997 colon think different and then Silicon Valley 2018 colon think the same yeah and uh, and so there is something that's uh, that's gone that's gone a bit wrong even though you know it's it's I'm hard pressed to cite things where you know it's, it's really affected me personally yeah all right well I, I was actually gonna push that to a little bit later but let's just stay with that for now then do you remember moments did you see some markers along the way where you realized some of this group think was affecting the actual products where, where the actual ability to create new technologies or new products, where that was actually causing stagnation. Because uh, I sense, yes. it's, been, I sense yes. it's been sort of a long road to get here, but you have sort of been talking about this for a while now. And I think there's a direct connection to the diversity myth, which uh, we'll also talk about, which you wrote you know, 20 years ago. Right, right. Well, I, I do think Silicon Valley has shifted a lot over, over the years. So when I was an undergraduate at Stanford in the late 1980s, uh, Stanford was sort of a very liberal, politically correct place, but um, the Silicon Valley surrounding, uh, not so much. It was vaguely libertarian, uh, you know, it was, it was a moderate Republican congressional district, and, um, and then sort of by the late 90s, I would say it had shifted to being sort of a moderate, um, moderate Democrat, which was around the time I started PayPal. And if you fast forward another 20 years, it's sort of um, it's 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 sort of a pretty hard left. Yeah. So what do and you so think? It's, it's, what do you it, think it happened just, there? Because it seems to me that if I was taking the people that I wanted to be the most creative, the most outside the box, the most to look at the system and go, how do we fix the system from the outside? You'd want a lot of libertarian thinkers. That's that's the way I would at least look at it. So you'd think that everyone in Silicon Valley would be pretty libertarian. They want to do things on their own, and yet somehow in those 20 years. It, it became the opposite. Well, it's it's like you know when you ask a question, you know, why, why is it why is it so uh, so left wing? I think these things are you know they're, they're somewhat overdetermined. So I, I would say uh, part of it is um, is that uh, it's probably the most educated part of the country in terms of how much time people spent in college. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the downsides of too much education is that you get uh, the most brainwashed. And so it's 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 the most educated can also mean that it is it is the it is the most brainwashed. Uh, you know. Um, this is perhaps not so true of the founders, but certainly of um, of many of the the rank and file people who are, um, you know, if you're sort of like a really good engineer or um, you know a really good at some specific thing, um, your education typically does not involve you thinking that much about about politics, and so uh, it's not necessarily from deep ideological conviction. It's often more as a fashion statement than as a question of of power, and so. Uh, and so one of the things that's always a little bit hard to score is that even though if you took a survey in Silicon Valley, it's it's it comes out as you know quite far to the left, you know weirdly um, uniform, weird sort of groupthink. It's uh, super hard to know whether people really believe this, whether they're whether they're just going along. And right. So I I think it's pretty liberal, but um, but of course not as liberal as it looks, and that's that's in a way worse <laughs> because it means people are you know too scared to. To articulate things, right? There was a there was a dinner I had at my house uh, a week before the uh, 2016 election with a group of sort of center right Silicon Valley people. One of them was a uh, uh, is a very prominent angel investor in Silicon Valley, and he said, um, uh, "You know, I'm voting for Trump in a week, but because I live in Silicon Valley, I'm lying about it." And so, uh, and so the meanwhile, way, he's saying this to you. So there's like <laughs> about 12, 12 people at dinner, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, and. Uh, you're like, I'm the guy was, that just was, spoke at the convention. He was, he was honest about lying. So yeah. This is unusual. This is a little bit unusual. Yeah. And, um, and the way I lie is I tell people I'm voting for Gary Johnson, the libertarian. So it's like, you couldn't, you couldn't quite get away 
telling people that he was voting for Hillary Clinton uh -huh. because like your facial muscles wouldn't work and people could tell <laughs> that you're lying. It was sort of small eye, Gary Johnson, that was sort of what you what you could do. Yeah. And uh, and I think, you know, if if you sort of looked at what happened in the weeks before the election, the uh, the Gary Johnson support sort of collapsed, it all went to Trump. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the question you have to ask is whether uh, did those people just change their minds the last minute, or were they lying all along, or were they lying to themselves? And uh, and so I think the the sort of political correctness, you know, it's always bad for thought, but it always makes things appear more uniform than they are, even in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Well, I think you know this. I said I was going to vote for G Gary Johnson, and I did vote for Gary Johnson. And as I always say, I should be judged accordingly. But here we are. So this is actually a perfect segue then to the diversity myth, because 20 years ago, you're you're at Stanford, and you saw a lot of the problems that we are talking about today over and over again. I, I told you a couple months ago, I was listening on C-SPAN to a talk you gave about the diversity mm -hmm. myth. And again, it's from about, I think at that point it was like 18 years ago or something, and I was listening to it, and David walked into the room, and he said, who is that talking? Because it was all true, and it was, he thought it was somebody, I, he thought I was listening to the news of today, like somebody laying out what's going on today, but you saw this, this issue with multiculturalism, with faux diversity, the focus on equality of mm -hmm. outcome, not opportunity. You saw all this way before, mm -hmm seemingly anyone did. How, how did that come to be? Well, it was, um, there was certainly um, quite a wave of this stuff in the late 80s, early 90s on you know, a number of college campuses. And for a variety of reasons, um, you know, a lot of it crystallized at Stanford. There was, a, there was this, uh, there was this um, super intense debate about uh, Western culture, which was both a freshman, one year long freshman sort of general humanities course, where you learned about, you know, Western culture, history, Western civilization, um, but then it was, of course, and the and there was sort of Jesse Jackson showed up at campus one one day and sort of led this chant, "Hey, hey, ho, ho! Western culture's got to go," and people were talking about both the course and, of course, the whole society and culture that was represented by that, and uh, and and then and, and so there were a lot of these different debates that got uh, um, got sort of thrown up. So it was you know it was concerned about. Discrimin racial discrimination, gender discrimination, you know, other kinds of people who were victimized. Uh, and, then, um, and then in many cases, it felt like it was this incredible overreach where people were in some sense using their victim status as a stick with which to beat other people up mm -hmm. or, or so something like that. Or we're, you know, we're gonna now victimize the victimizers. And, and, uh, and so it's gonna be sort of uh, something like that. And, uh, and so multiculturalism and political correctness were somehow um, very linked. The, the multiculturalism part was where we're, we're going to um, give uh, special privileges, um, you know, uh, to disadvantaged people, or we're going to somehow correct these injustices of the past. And the politically, the intolerant, politically correct part was where we're going to go after uh, their oppressors, whether they were real or imagined. And uh, and in many ways, it, it felt like you know, incredible overreach. Uh, you ended up with uh, with these uh, draconian speech codes on campus. Um, and and with, with sort of the humanities, in a sense, effectively got gutted in the late 80s at Stanford, even though, of course, it took you know, many years for that to, to, to fully play out. But, uh, and then, then, of course, one of the buzzwords then is now um, was diversity, mm -hmm. which, um, which uh, and, and, you know, I think, I think diversity is a good thing. I think especially, you know, diversity of ideas mm -hmm. is, 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 is to be valued. But you don't have real diversity when you just have a group of people uh, who look different and uh, and think alike, and so it's, it's it has to be it has to be more than just uh, you know than just um, having the extras from the space cantina scene in Star Wars <laughs> or something like that, right? And uh, and that's and so that's always that's always so it's always like an internal critique. The diversity myth is that it's it's not about diversity at all. It's about it's about uh, conformity. Was that the first time that you had really staked out what is seemingly an unpopular position, although I think actually, especially in 2018, is, is quite a popular position, even if it's thought of as, as out there. Was that the first time you had publicly, because nobody wants to be the guy that says this stuff and then immediately is gonna be called a racist and a bigot and a homophobe, all those things. Had you ever done anything like that before? You know, it's, it's uh you know, I, I probably, you know, I, it's it's hard to know how, how far to go back in the pre-autobiographical right. history or how good 
I am at this, but but probably already, you know, junior high school, high school, I would, you know, I would, um, you know, I would take the positions that I believed in, and you know, they wouldn't they wouldn't necessarily be the the majority positions. And so it was, you know, it, you know, in you know junior high school, I was um, totally against drug legalization of any sort, and that was a minority. That was a minority view, mm -hmm. or uh, I, I supported Reagan in 1980, and you know, you know, we were sort of in a relatively liberal area, and that was again sort of a, a minority view. So, so I think I I would have had, uh, I, would, I wouldn't say like extreme outlier positions, but uh, but I, I've I've always thought that uh, it was important to think for yourself. Yeah. So when you wrote the book and then started talking about these issues, what kind of pushback did you get? Because that I think is the core issue that most of my viewers are identifying with these days, that they're taking positions that are true, that don't mean that they're racists or bigots mm -hmm. or homophobes, but that they mean they care about more about mm -hmm. diversity of ideas than diversity of skin color or those things. And, and they're scared to say those ideas, and yet you were doing it a long time ago. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's, always, a, it's always a very tricky thing. So it's, it's, it's um, on some level, um, on some level, the way you know, we've just been talking about it, uh, there aren't that many people who will who will go out of the way to disagree with us. So people, you know, you, you don't have people. I mean, there's some people, but most people would say, you know, <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> we, we, you know, we don't we, yeah. we 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 don't want any different views, or you know, we need to suppress views. People, and some people say that, but not not really that many. Right. Well, they mask um, it in other ways, right? No one's going to outright say but that. But then, but then in practice, yeah, you end up with this uh, with this uh, with this incredible conformity, even though that's not in theory what people what people want. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the one of the professors I studied under at Stanford is uh, Rene Girard, who's sort of this uh, cultural critic, philosopher, uh, literary uh, theorist, is really brilliant guy. And he sort of always had this mimetic theory that people imitate each other, they copy each other, they're sort of, um, they're much more prone to fashion and things like this. And, uh, and one of them, he was, he was from France, uh, and so one of, the, one of the metaphors he had for a lot of the sort of more politically correct professors at Stanford was um, that they all thought they were in the French resistance. <laughs> but but um, if they had lived in Vichy, France, they would have all been collaborators. Huh. And, um, and, and so the, the, the self-understanding people have is that they're super courageous, independent thinkers, and that's why they, and, 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 and that they would have been in the resistance in France. But then in reality, if you ask them what the views are that they have, it's the same as everybody else around them. Yeah, well, that's and you why have the... To, and you have to always ask, if everyone has the same views, it can mean one of two things. It can mean that you've reached the absolute truth, or it can mean that, uh, that you, have, uh, you have this sort of incredible conformity. Yeah, well, it's so interesting, because he was talking about the resistance in France, and now we have a group of people in America that think that they're part of the resistance. And I suspect that if they were in power, they would be treating the people who were the the resistance of them much worse than they're being treated right now. Well, I I, I I've thought that the 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 Girard critique could also apply to them that uh, that uh, you know by identifying yourself as part of you know some mob like resistance movement, you're you're suggesting the exact opposite. That, yeah. Uh, that uh, you know it 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 counts. You know political views. You know I, I respect. Uh, you know. I think there are people who can have sincere views even if they're in the overwhelming majority. But it's it's impressive if you're in the minority. So if you're if you're speaking out against President Trump in your small town in Alabama, um, I tend to think that's a you sincere like that person. Guy. Yeah. If you're if you're in if you're in San Francisco or Manhattan, um, and uh, and you're you're part of the resistance. Um, I, I suspect something very different is going so that, on. So that, that's really interesting so, to so, me. You know, like like one, like a different way of getting at this is uh, yeah. is uh, it's all, you know in a democracy we always think the majority is right. So it's 51 and 49, 51 is probably right. If it's a big majority, it's even more right. So 70, 30, even even more right. But if it's 100 to zero, 99 to one, um, that's uh, that's where we start to suspect that we're not in a democracy, but we're in North Korea. Or that something's gone wrong with the voting machine, or something like this, and so when we have these sort of hothouse environments at, at places like Stanford or uh, or Silicon Valley, um, where uh, you have this complete, um, you know, uniformity of thought, um, the thing you have to suspect is not the wisdom of crowds. It's not that everyone's figured out the truth. It's a madness of crowds. It's some psychosocial 
insanity. Yeah, and this seems to be directly linked to what's going on on our campuses today, right? I mean, if, if 20 years ago you had been thinking mm -hmm. these things, do you think your prediction would have been, oh, we'll be able to break these ideas enough so that the, the class of teachers and professors may not be so addicted yeah, to no, these it's, things? Yeah, no, it seems to have come back with a vengeance yeah. on, uh, on, on college, or even, even you know, radicalized further. But, uh, but again, it, it, it's, uh, you know, this is sort of, this is like, it's a, it's a, it's a subtle, you know, you don't want to always psychologize uh, people you disagree with, but, but the, the question when you look at what's happening on campuses or in, in various places is always, is this really what people think, or is it just, are they just under, you know, incredible peer pressure to fit in? Yeah, do you see that as a bizarre direct connection to the way many other institutions seem to be crumbling now, the way people don't trust the media the way they used to, the way that we're just seeing sort of a new, you know, Alan on Rogan last week, you're sitting here today, the way that people want different conversations. We're gonna sit here for as long as it well, takes people, to do people, all of people this. People can see through it. Yeah. They can, they can see through um, the manufactured consent. They can see, they can, um, you know, it's, it's, if you have conformity and it, and it looks real, that's powerful. If it, if it's conformity and people sense that it's forced, that's that's a lot shakier. And so there's, it's it's sort of like I don't know. It's like the I'm not sure what the right metaphor is, but it's like maybe maybe it's like you know, the Wizard of Oz where you have the man behind the curtain and we're looking at the man behind the curtain on the internet and uh, and that it doesn't quite work. And you know our, I think our sort of media political machine maybe it, maybe it always worked when people didn't understand how it works. And so if you if you sort of see what's going on in the sausage making factory, uh, you know you might not want to eat as much sausage anymore. Yeah, all right, well this is clearly gonna be a theme to almost everything else we talk about. So let's let's sort of catch up to where you are today and then we're gonna go back to some of that stuff. Uh, tell me a little bit about Palantir. Well, this was, uh, this was another company I started uh, in, uh, in 2004. Uh, it was um, sort of the big, pic the big picture where PayPal was sort of revolutionize money and, and payments. The big picture for Palantir, and this was sort of like in the wake of 9-11, few years after that was um, could one do something from a libertarian or civil liberties point of view that would still be you know tough on terrorism and uh, and and things like this and um, and the the sort of uh, the sort of sense I had was that uh, that uh, the way we were going with just you know ridiculous airport security checks and uh, you know, super intrusive uh, surveillance all the time you know, wasn't really making us safer. Yeah, and so this was sort of your answer to the Patriot Act in a way. In a way, this was sort of, you know, it was like, I, you, know, you had the ridiculous lines at airports, you'd been, you know, through all, all, all the ways that, uh, you know, the response, to, um, and, uh, and, it was, and there was a question, was there some way, was there some technological fix? And, you know, one of the ways I often think of technology is um, that it's a way to do more with less. And, um, and so, you know, you can, um, you can get, um, you know, you can get more energy for less money. That's like an energy innovation, mm -hmm. or cleaner energy for, you know, less pollution, um, more energy that pollutes less. That would be like a technolo technology innovation in clean energy. And in the security space, the doing more with less is something like, um, is something like more security with less intrusion on people's civil liberties. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the trade-off that you want. And that uh, the non-technological debate that we had in the U.S. in 2004, in many ways that we still have in 2018, is um, it's always uh, it's always you do more with more versus less with less. <laughs> right. And so you can have the um, the neocon um, Cheney version, let's say, would be that we're going to have um, you know we're going to have um, you know more security with more civil liberties violations, and then you can sort of say that the um, equally Luddite, ACLU would say something like, "We're going to have fewer, um, um, you know, civil liberties violations, and we're going to have less security." Right. And um, and that's kind of the that's the the way the ideological debate gets framed. Mm -hmm. Now I I'm sympathetic to the ACLU on civil liberties, uh -huh. but I think they will always lose that debate because uh, the way you preserve civil liberties is not to have terrorist attacks. Because when you get a terrorist attack, you get the Patriot Act, and uh, you know, if, if the World Trade Center would erode civil liberties as much as it did in 2001, I didn't even want to think what would happen if you had another terrorist attack. And so yeah. you have to prevent it 
to, uh, to, stop, uh, to stop more erosion. What Palantir does is, uh, is um, it, 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 it sort of is a way for, um, for, uh, for um, you know, patterns and data to be um, visualized through a combination of computers and human analysts. And, um, and, then, um, and then in a way that doesn't simply scour the planet and get all the information about everybody. So it's just, if there's something suspicious, then you look some more. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's sort of a, there's a natural predicate you build before you, you investigate people. And in, in that sense, it's, it's way less intrusive. Is this a tough position to hold just because people seem all too eager to give up their civil liberties? Like, we always want easy answers, so that's why I think the Patriot Act passed with two dissenting votes, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that people don't really, we act so emotionally all the time, mm -hmm. and especially after a time like September 11th, we were really, I think, out of whack individually mm -hmm. and collectively, mm -hmm. that you can come in with a, mm -hmm. a more sane answer and say, I understand civil liberties and I don't want big government, but I want us all to be safe. And that that's almost doesn't ring for people because they just want the easy answer. They want the bumper sticker answer. Yes. Yes, I, I think it's, it's not the easiest sell, but, uh, but I, I think there is certainly a lot more awareness today about how much civil liberties have been eroded, you know, how we're living in this quasi-surveillance state all the time and how Know, deeply uncomfortable uh, that is on, on on so many levels I think that uh, I think that uh, the way um, you know I think certainly if it worked if the if the Luddite heavy-handed approaches actually worked mm -hmm. um, then I think people people would be more tolerant and then there's there's sort of a sense that they they don't even they don't even work. Yeah, is it hard to define what work even means? Because something could say work for three years, make sure everybody's safe, even if it's violating all sorts of personal privacy and all that, but then if there's an attack, then you well, go, well, it doesn't work. Well, work means you, you prevent terrorist attacks from happening in, the, in, the, in that narrow, narrow context. So it's just about the, the window that it works, basically. Well, because the second it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And well, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's how many you prevent that would have otherwise happened. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's it, it, it maybe if it works perfectly, it would prevent all of them. If it, you know, works pretty well, it prevents most, and yeah. something like that. So this must be a little bit of a, a tricky situation for you because you obviously have to work with the government on some of this stuff, right? And I'm sure that that's probably not thrilling for you at some level. Well, I look, I I I, I believe that uh, I believe that uh, uh, it's you know I I believe you can be both a, a libertarian and uh, and and work with the government or even work for the government or work in the government. Uh, and uh, and even, even if you believe that there should be a much smaller, much less intrusive government, you can still try to work to make it function better. And, and, and so there's both an outside and inside game. Yeah. You know, there's all these versions like this. So it's like if you're a libertarian, should you refuse to take a social security check? <laughs> and uh, well, you, you can be against social security and still personally collect a check. I'm pretty sure Ayn or, Rand took Social you know, Security. Yeah. If you're, you know, if you're a libertarian, should you refuse to be a public school teacher because you're uh, working with the government? Well, maybe, maybe it's actually better to be a public school teacher rather than some the socialist uh, person who will otherwise get it by default. So, so right. I, I think, uh, I think, uh, I think we can we can have certain kinds of principles and then and then act in, in pragmatic ways, and this isn't necessarily hypocrisy. You once said to me, and I'm sure you've said it to other people, that I wouldn't be a libertarian if it worked. Do you sort of picture a moment, or do you remember a moment where you think it, I guess basically big government, stopped working? Because it, it did work for a while, basically, right? But not, not in our lifetimes, not, or not very well in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, it's, it's easier to see with, uh, with, with the benefit of hindsight. But I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I used to think, you know, when I, when I was in college in, in the 1980s, I used to think that libertarianism was a timeless, an eternal thing. It was just these absolute truths for all time, all places, and all times. Mm -hmm. And I've I've now come to think that it's it can be sort of there's certain contexts where it's more true or less true. And so if you have um, you know, if you have incredibly well functioning government political institutions, there's sort of you know less of a need for libertarianism. So you know in the 1950s or 1960s when uh, the state of California had first-rate public schools mm -hmm. across the board. Um, and if you said, well, the government can't do anything, the public schools can't work, um, there might have been 
problems with them, but that, w that argument would have gotten a lot less traction than it would today in 2018. Right, because you'd um, be the utopian person at that point, right? Or, yeah, or you'd be, or you'd be too, you'd be too pessimistic, because right. obviously things, things, things weren't that <laughs> right. bad. Horseshoe theory on and, that one, um, yeah. And, and certainly, um, or in the military context, we had, uh, you know, we had the, uh, the, um, you know, the, um, the atom bomb, we had the Manhattan Project, we had the Apollo space program in the 1960s, um, where you got a man on the moon. And so if you said the government can't do anything, that, uh, that, that felt uh, somewhat wrong. Now I, I, now I think, I think the thing, if we were honest, and this is, this is always the, you know, somewhat disturbing thing, is that our government works much less well than it used to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think. So I, that's my question. Do you I, do you look I at a moment think, where that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I think libertarianism, you know, it started probably failing in the 1970s, uh, in a serious way. I mean, maybe it was really building up in various ways. But uh, and um, and libertarianism, the Libertarian Party in the U.S. started in the early 70s, and it sort of makes sense because there was sort of more of an opening, and so it, it was more true then than it had been before. And I would argue that uh, it is uh, it is m much more true in 2018 than it was uh, 30 years 30 years ago. Um, you know the uh, the um, you know when the Ayn Rand books were written in the 1950s, it, it was like it, it felt like it was crazy. You know when I when I when I first you know, because it was like so bleak, so pessimistic, and uh -huh. things were so you know so um, so busted, so broken. You know when when I first read them in like the late 80s, um, it. It still felt pretty crazy, you know. Uh, and then, the last decade, it's it's in many ways felt, you know, much more correct. There was, you know, there's a, in uh, in Atlas Shrugged, there's a, um, they're trying to find who, you know, um, who is John Galt. The clues eventually take them to the state where everything has gone haywire. Mm -hmm. It's the state of Michigan, mm -hmm. and uh, there's this great company, the 20th Century American Motor Company, which is sort of a thinly disguised General Motors that had just gone bankrupt. And it was because it had been completely mismanaged along these sort of socialist kinds of principles. Um, and Detroit was sort of falling apart. Someone was farming in the middle of the city. And, uh, and this was like 1957. It was yeah. just sort of a crazy thing. And then it's, 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 it's disturbingly more true today. Yeah, well, Yaron Brook, who used to be the head of it, uh, ARI, Ayn Rand Institute, who I've had on the show many times and I, I do some speaking events with, he always tells me that when he travels internationally now, that it's the countries that are sort of worse off at the moment that are just trying to reset that find those ideas the most interesting because they're just desperate for ideas. Yes. So in a way, it almost sounds like you're calling libertarianism almost a course correction for when either capitalism or, not necessarily capitalism, for when big government just gets out of control, libertarian can come in, libertarianism can come in and kind of well, that's the, un that's, unfurl yeah, some that's, of it. That's the hope. I mean, yeah. certainly, um, uh, a lot of these sort of bad uh, bureaucratic things don't don't self-correct that much, and uh, it is probably very hard for there to be incremental reform from within, and that's why something like sort of a libertarian shock therapy yeah. maybe maybe what you actually uh, maybe what you actually need. Um, but uh, but yeah, you know, one one way to think about what what's happened in the U.S. is you had um, you had sort of institutions set up, and then over time. Um, they sort of ossified and degraded. So, you know, when NASA was started in the in the 1950s, you had you know great scientists that were driven, motivated, and then eventually it became sort of more and more bureaucratic, and somehow the politics replaced the science, and we can't reset it. You know, so in, is in that private, where we're something, at? Something like this. I think something like this happens, by the way, in a lot of the private sector, where mm -hmm. you know big companies become bureaucratic and less functional, but in the private sector. You can have new companies get started, and if uh, big companies are too badly run, they go broke. And in the government thing, you know, for government to go broke, it has to be incredibly bad. And the and the tricky question is always, how do you course correct before you get there? Right. So, do you have a general prescription for how government and private enterprise can work together? Is is there a general view on when it is right? That seems to be what a lot of people are talking about right now. Because I do sense that there's a, as I would call it, sort of a classical liberal movement happening right now, or a libertarian movement. And the question always is, well, when then is the right moment for government to do more? Or, well, or do less, depending on which way you look um, at it. You know, I don't. I don't know if I have a sort of formulaic general answer. My yeah. my um, my ideological bias as a libertarian is that we should have a smaller government that's less intrusive, less regulatory, mostly across the board. I don't think I have to tell you exactly 
how small it should be. It should just be, it should do less. Right. You know, we don't have to talk about, you know, do we have to privatize roads or, you know, all the sort of crazy. Right, that's where everyone projects. goes. You don't can have, have driver's licenses. You don't have to, don't yeah. have to set all the boundaries. We know we have, there's a lot of, lot of room uh, to go uh, big picture. And then I think in terms of the details, um, there are, of course, always these ways that you can try to reform things, try to make things work better. Uh, recognizing that you often have you know, super entrenched bureaucracy. So, you know, if you, if you can shift from public schools to charter schools, that's sort of a way to change the bureaucracy. If you could, if you could uh, shift things where you could, um, you could fire people or if you could shut down agencies, that would probably reform things quite a bit, even though that's, that's uh, seemingly a very hard lift. Yeah, so I wanted to hold Trump a little bit longer, but I feel like this is the right segue because there's an interesting piece of Trump that I think a lot of people, a lot of libertarians are happy with when it you know, comes to cutting taxes, cutting regulation, which he's done a ton of, and a, and a few other things in that regard. And then on the other hand, it seems that there is a piece of him that's more than happy to do as many things by his executive action as they'll allow him to do. And maybe in some cases he would try to do things that they wouldn't allow him to do. So you supported the guy, so let, let, let's just start there. When, when it was bubbling up in your head that, that you were gonna support him or at least, or get, you gave his campaign money, all of that, what kind of internal discussion were you having with yourself or were you having it with friends and, and colleagues and things like that? Well, um, well the, uh, one, one of the things that, uh, that I would say was, um, is I think a super important issue for me and, uh, and I think should be for, for libertarians generally, is, is foreign policy. And I believe that uh, the U.S. should have a less interventionist foreign policy. I believe that we've gotten into uh, too many stupid wars um, over the years. Um, and that, uh, um, you know, that sort of these questions of you know, if the government can kill you or can, that's sort of like, that's maybe one of the most intrusive forms of government action. <laughs> I think that counts, We should, think, we should counts, think really yeah. hard about, you know, how often uh, we, we we do that, and um, and that there was some there was some need to to reset that, and I think, uh, and so, if you from my point of view, if you if you got someone who's not great on a lot of issues, but was libertarian on foreign policy, that would count for a lot, and if you had one who was good on a lot of other issues, but bad on foreign policy, um, that would actually eroded in a lot of ways. And I think, you know, the Bush 43 administration mm -hmm. was also sort of lower tax, anti-regulatory, but then because you had the, uh, the insane war in Iraq, um, and you had to have all these deficits, and then you had to do congressional log rolling, and so then you end up with no child left behind, you end up with the Medicare Part D, the whole, you know, the, all the sort of crazy expansion of, um, of the welfare state as part of the log rolling exercise for for the for the foreign wars, and so um, if we're going to do the anti Bush forty three, you know, if we have a, actually have a smaller government, maybe the um, the sort of our committee and lever for moving that is foreign policy, and is for us to be uh, to be less engaged. And I, I think that that is um, you know, and it, it, it was, and this was this was the place where where Trump broke the most sharply from uh, Republican orthodoxy mm -hmm. in the primaries. You know, the, the person he was sort of most opposed to was, you know, Jeb Bush, yeah. who was somehow represented, you know, just a continuation of, of the war strategy. And you had these devastating questions, like, you know, was, was the Iraq war a bad idea? And Jeb had never thought about it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's something like that. I mean, you know, right, right, right. Roughly, and, um, and it was, and they had never thought about it because you had this uh, Washington, D.C., um, pro-war, foreign policy bubble, and it was the Clintons, the Bushes, you know, Obama had maybe moderated a little bit, but still, we got pulled into Syria, we sort of messed up Libya even more than it had been before, and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and I think Trump represented, you know, a really big break from this. I gave, I gave two, uh, I did, you know, I spoke at the convention in 2016, and mm -hmm. I also spoke in, in, in the fall at the, uh, at the uh, Washington Press Club, in both speeches, I, I stressed this foreign policy theme, and so it was, uh, it was that uh, you know, should we, um, should we, should the U.S. really be, you know, uh, how aggressively should the U.S. be involved in Syria and risk, you know, a confrontation with, uh, with, with Russia, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think Trump's instincts continue to be, um, you know, much less in this in this sort of. A superpower confrontation, and if you if you look at where the opposition to, to President Trump comes from, 
the, the, the sort of the most deranged part of it is from um, the neoconservative Republicans mm -hmm. because this is where he's broken the most with orthodoxy. We have, you know, I think that the Russia debate is a completely insane debate that we have like this where, um, you know, it's, and, and it, I think Trump has been consistent for, you know, 30 years. We should not have a, you know, it, even if Putin's an evil man, it doesn't mean that we should, you know, be risking a nuclear war with, with Russia. Right. You know, sort of, that escalate. used to be a position of the left, by the way, right? As, as, I mean, recently, as, 2012, as right. recently as 2012, when, you know, when Romney was hawkish on Russia and Obama said the 80s are calling. Yeah. And this is like, uh, and then, and so it's, it's, it's it, there's something about it that's just incredibly uh, crazy how tribal it is. Well, it's so interesting because that moment in the debate between Romney and Obama, if the left was being consistent about this, they'd be looking at Obama now and going, man, you must have been the worst president of all time because you misjudged that and then that led us to our Russian puppet president or something. But you don't see that side, you don't see that sort of consistency at anyone these days, uh, I suppose. Yeah, it's, 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 it's in, it, it feels incredibly deranged, but, uh, but certainly the intuition is that uh, um, we shouldn't be this fixated on you know, escalating, um, escalating these potentially military conflicts with, with places like Russia. Mm -hmm. and, and to the extent we have that as, as the focus, it distracts us from, from a lot of other things. It distracts us from the, the very real economic competition we have with China, mm -hmm. and, uh, which I think is something we should be taking more seriously. And then, of course, um, even more importantly, maybe distracts us from, um, from uh, solving some of the problems at home. So I, I do think, you know, the foreign po having a less aggressive foreign policy, that's maybe the preliminary step to, to getting, uh, to then to really fixing on, you know, solving our own problems. Does that show you how, how deranged the conversation has gotten? Because if you listen to conventional thinking on this, most of, I think, Trump's critics will say, look, he's saying all these things about North Korea, or he's making all these threats about Syria, or we dropped the mother of all bombs, or all of these things. But you're actually making the reverse argument. I mean, they're trying to argue that he's really the warmonger. He's the one that's going to lead us to World War III. And really, your argument is he's the one doing the reverse of those things, at least at yes. least for now. Yes. I mean, look, I think, I think there is, we have a certain type of military industrial complex. And so there are parts of this that are sort of almost on autopilot. But, uh, but, but certainly, I think all of President Trump's instincts are to, you know, it's like, you know, if, if um, we have to rethink NATO, we have to, you know, rethink, you know, how much we should really be committed to Afghanistan. We have to, you know, we shouldn't be escalating like crazy with, with Russia. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, um, yeah, the North Korea dictator's a genocidal maniac, but we'll talk to him. So I, th I think the instincts are, um, are, are very powerfully in the uh, de-escalatory side. What is it about Trump that made you think this is the guy could do that? Because as I was hearing you say that, you could have said, well, Ron, uh, Rand Paul, he's, he's doing a pretty good job on that stuff, right? He's been talking about getting out of these wars for a long time. Like you could have been mm -hmm. like, all right, mm -hmm. that, even when I would watch the debates, I'd be like, this poor guy, he's on the stage with the wrong group of people. He's making a lot of sense to me, uh, but this isn't well, the support, crew. I supported, you know, I did yeah. support Ron Paul, uh, Ron Paul in both 2008 and 2012. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I think in, in, in some ways, uh, um, um, Rand Paul was sort of making those arguments. Well, I, I actually think Trump made them more powerfully in the 2015, 2016 primaries than even, even uh, Rand Paul. And, uh, you know, if I had to critique Rand Paul a little bit mm -hmm. on this, uh, it, um, it was sort of, he was sort of making this judgment call that his dad hadn't been able to get enough votes. And so he had to be a little bit uh, less dovish on foreign policy, uh -huh. he had to be a little bit more agreeable. And of course, um, he did end up doing much less well than his dad because he sort of, in a way, uh, downplayed what might have been one of his best issues. And then, and then Trump just articulated far more powerfully. So what is that X factor thing with Trump? Because obviously this was starting to be like a runaway train and the, all the momentum was there, all the media attention was there. It, takes us kind of back to the beginning of when we sat down, the way you described PayPal, when it started really getting into that growth phase. So you must have seen that too, and thought, all right, the right ideas are kind of here, but really what I'm seeing is... Well, it's, it's, well there's, um, you're at least talking about some things. You're mm -hmm. talking about some of the important substantive things that we should be talking about. And, uh, and uh, you know, part of, again, part of the, the negative part is that it's a contrast to how bad <laughs> and a lot of the other people were. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I, I met a number of the different Republican candidates running 
in 2016 in you know, small one-on-one -on -one meetings. And I mean, they were like zombies, wow. you know, and it was just, you know, you had you know, sort of the ideological talking points. Um, it was sort of not fluid, very hard to, uh, to um, get off script to, to say anything. And, um, and that somehow wasn't, wasn't quite what was called for. And of course, you know, you know, there was something else about, you know, Hillary Clinton that was very much like this. And, uh, and I think, you know, I think the, the revisionist, you know, sort of history people like to now say is that Hillary Clinton was this terrible candidate. And I, you know, I think, no, I think she was, she was the, the best candidate the establishment could put up. Um, you know, it was just the ideas were wrong. They didn't make sense. You know, Hillary Clinton thinks she should run again in 2020. <laughs> and, and in a way she's right because, you know, from her point of view, I can understand why she thinks that because um, she's smarter than the other Democrats. She mm -hmm. has more experience. And, you know, within the zombie establishment, um, it, may, it still makes more sense for it to be Hillary than it, you know, someone like Cory Booker or Kamala Harris. Yeah. But um, the ideas are just the ideas were just, had just become, you know, completely ossified. What does it say about sort of the state of the West that when things are are basically pretty good, not to say they're perfect, but basically pretty good, that it, there's always this feeling that the establishment has to be destroyed or washed away. Well, um, well, we there's. Well, that's a big question, but I, I, I think there's something that goes back in our, you know, we, we are, you know, there's something about Western, you know, Western civilization that is, you know, it is perhaps unique as sort of like it's, it's open, it's, um, it's self-referential, self-critical, and so, um, and so, uh, and, and you don't have this sort of internal self-criticism in, um, in other societies mm -hmm. and other cultures, and so, you know, there's always, there's always an argument that you know ours is an extre extremely racist, sexist society that discriminates in all kinds of ways, and um, you know without challenging that for now, um, you can also say that ours is a society that cares a lot about racism, sexism, that cares a lot about injustices, that the ways things are not working, and so I think, um, and so I think the establishment, you know, has not gotten a free pass in our society for uh, for a very long time, and that's. And you can say that's that's unhealthy and it makes us weak or divided, but uh, but I think it's it's uh, it's that's part of the motor that drives our our civilization. And you know, maybe it you know maybe it goes back to you know you know in sort of the Enlightenment or the Renaissance or um, you know the Greco-Roman or Judeo-Christian traditions. But uh, you know, it's uh, when 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 Jesus Christ says that he's the Son of God. Um, you know, you can say, you can describe that as a metaphysical religious statement, mm -hmm. but you can also describe it as a politically atheist statement, <laughs> because Caesar Augustus was the emperor, and Caesar, his sort of adopted father, had been divinized, and so Caesar Augustus also claimed to be the son of God, and so when Jesus Christ says that he's the son of God, that is a challenge to the establishment. That's an act of political atheism. It's the state is not divine. The establishment is not divine, and that I think that's that's just that's that's just been part of our civilization. And I'd be I'd be much more worried if people stopped stopped uh, stopped stopped asking these questions. Yeah. So for the people that are watching or listening to this right now that still have all the concerns about Trump that you may or may not have, or or that you feel maybe are somewhat deranged in terms of the conversation, you've met the guy obviously a bunch of times. You know, there's that one. Uh, video when you guys had that slightly awkward handshake. Is there anything, well first I guess I have two parts to this. One is do you have any regrets about supporting him or speaking at the convention? And I want to talk a little bit more about that in a minute also. Um, but also is there something that you can impart on us that maybe we don't know or that's, that's not being told uh, you know, just from sitting down with the guy, is, is he more stable than, than the way the media would portray it or something along those lines? We certainly, or less. He's certainly very smart. And uh, and it, it sort of is a common sense, intuitive thing. And so there's there's sort of a way that, you know, he can X-ray people and can get an, an immediate read on on somebody that's that's incredibly impressive. Yeah. And so. Do you um, think there's a risk in that also? Always relying on that instinct as opposed to well, maybe. Well, it's it's well, I, you know, there always are risks with these things. But yeah. that's that's you know, it's it's a it's a powerful ability. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, 
and then uh, and then there is a degree to which it you know he has his ideas, and um, you know it, it's sort of he's thought these things through for himself, and uh, and sort of the evidence that you know he's not as conformist is that is that the ideas are actually pretty different. You know, it's, it's, it's you know he's broken with the Republican orthodoxy on foreign policy. You know, there's um, you know rethinking the immigration question, rethinking the, the free trade questions. And um, and these are these are these were like not uh, not mainstream views at all pre 2016. Yeah. And um, and there is a way in which uh, you know, what I, what I think has been even more impressive than I would have expected is is the degree to which the debate has shifted. And so if we if we take the the um, the debate about free trade, you know, the consensus in 2015 would have been um, free trade is simply good in all times and all places. Mm -hmm. And um, if you don't understand that, then you didn't study econ one, and you're you know you're a low IQ person. End of argument. And um, and at this point, you know it's it's much closer to you know there's obviously something just very very wrong with a lot of the trade arrangements in the world. And it's like uh, you know we have we have uh, we um, import 475 billion dollars a year from China. We export 100 billion a year to China, and it's completely. Unbalanced, and um, and this is actually not. If, if we had a genuinely globalizing world, that's not the way it would look at all. Uh -huh. In a globalizing world, um, the uh, the less developed parts of the world would grow faster, and therefore um, capital should flow to those parts, and and therefore we should have a trade surplus with China, so that we get extra capital that we then export. So in a China. weird way, you're almost making a globalist argument and for him, even though his, well, he's always well, against the globalists. No, no, but I, let's no, say. I would say it's a little bit differently. So I, yeah. I would say that uh, I would say that um, the incredible trade imbalances tell us that something's completely mm -hmm. wrong with the uh, sort of Pollyannish globalization story we're told. Mm -hmm. you, know, it's, uh, you have Chinese peasants saving money, and it's being sent upstream <laughs> into the slower growing U.S. and the even slower growing Japan and Western Europe. And uh, it's all the money is flowing. It's flowing in the wrong direction, and that tells us something's you know. And then, you, and then we can debate you know what do you do about it, you know um, do you do you escalate in order to de-escalate? Do you do you um, how, you know how do you rethink these things? But uh, but it's it's all it's all been opened up. And I you know, the the prediction I would make is that whoever the Democratic nominee in 2020 is, they will not uh, they will not disagree with Trump on the trade issue. They, they won't admit that Trump changed their mind, mm -hmm. but this, I mean, this is one of the ways you win debates: is that uh, people come around to your side and they, they still say they never, and it wasn't because of you. <laughs> right? Was that's that, how you really win? Yeah. Was that his really clever move during the the primary still, where he kept saying, "Oh, look how unfairly the DNC is treating Bernie," because basically he was hinting to all of those people that were so frustrated with the system when they screw him over. Guess what? I'm your guy. It's not. It's not Hillary. So it was a pretty, pretty, pretty clever little tip of well, the hat. Well, there are all these, all these things like this. But I, but I think I think it is. It is just these other debates where, uh, the the country, you know. I, th I think you know the question about NATO is, is on the table now. Mm -hmm. And you know, once you put it on the table, uh, you know, why should the U.S. be paying, the lion's share? When we're actually mostly defending these other countries, it's right. not like NATO's on the southern border defending us from Mexico. Right, right. And you, if you listen to the way the mainstream media focuses it, it's always well, uh, Trump wants to blow up NATO, but that's not really what he said. He said he wants other countries to pay their fair share. Yes. Those are very, very different things. Yes, I mean they're they're, they're linked because you, you might say you know if if, if we don't, you know we're, we're we might be willing to pull out if you don't pay your fair share. So it's not mm -hmm. it's not like we're Never going to change, but uh, but certainly um, certainly uh, people people nobody would disagree that everyone should pay their fair share. I mean, when I talk to even people in Germany, which is like maybe the most egregious offender of all, <laughs> um, nobody disagrees with on this behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any regrets? I don't have any regrets about it. You know, I I I, I would say that it um, it certainly was a it's been a crazier two years than I would have thought, and uh, and. I underestimated how, um, you know, how intense some of the feelings people have about politics are, but no regrets. Yeah. What do you make of just the general tenor then, right now, that we sort of are between a rock and a hard place, where it's like you've got Trump and he's not going to change his tactics, 
And you know, I think I've been very fair to him, and that's why I get a lot of criticism on that front. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the the resistance, or whatever you want to call it, that seems to be doubling down on a lot of the bad ideas that got them there in the first place. And that both sides now are just splitting and splitting, and we're we're losing what I where I think most people are, which is within some sort of basically free society, libertarian, live and let live thing. I think I really believe that's where most people are, but we seem to be being pulled. In, in opposite ways. Well, um, the way the way I would I would frame it a little bit differently. I, I would say we're um, we're um, we're moving past the Bush Clinton um, sort of duopoly, mm -hmm. and um, and it, which was not exactly libertarian. Um, it was pretty narrow, pretty narrow zone. There wasn't very much debate. Um, you know, all the smart people supposedly agreed on everything, and it didn't work all that well at the end of the day. You know, we had sort of, uh, you know, one, one fake bubble in our economy after another, and, um, and, it, and you know, it sort of got us into a lot of things that, that were, were not optimal. And so, uh, so I think, you know, for the Bush-Clinton, maybe also Obama years, so those 24 years, the debate, I would say, was, 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 uh, was too narrow. And I think within that, that sort of super narrow center to center left debate in this country, uh, you, uh, you're not going to find the solutions to our problems. It's going to be, it's going to be way outside of that. And and I think, you know, I, th I think we will not go back. You know, we're not going to go back to Hillary Clinton in 2020. Mm -hmm. We're not going to go back to Jeb Bush. Um, and uh, it, it's it's going to be it's going to be a, a more wide open debate. And there, there are the parts of it that I don't like. Yeah. I don't. I, I think you know. I think uh, I think the socialist question is going to be on the table in ways that it hasn't been for a long time. And, uh, and I think, you know, I suspect the Democratic Party is going to move much further to the left. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a debate we're going to be having for the next decade. You know, I, I think they're wrong. I think that's not going to work. But it's, it's again, it's the Clinton, the narrow Clinton stuff, um, not going back to that. Okay, so one more thing on Trump for now. When, when you finally then came out, so to speak, and, and said, all right, I'm going to support uh, Trump, just personally, do you, do you feel like it cost you anything? Just you know, friends, family, like, or did you even care if that was gonna be the case? Because a certain amount of people are gonna go, no matter what you just said here about all the legitimate mm -hmm. issues related to trade and government and all that, mm -hmm. they're gonna go, he's racist, so now Teal's racist, or, or something along those lines. You know, I, I don't think, it didn't cost me any friendships. Um, and, you know, and, and, but there probably were, you know, there were, there were, there were some set of people that, um, you know, where they were mad at me that had not been mad at me before, and. You know that's unfortunate. Uh, I, I don't. I don't. Um, you know, I. I didn't think it was that controversial. You know, <laughs> I, uh, you know, sort of. I. Uh, it's, it's sort of like, like in one in one way, it was one of the least contrarian things I've ever done. It was like half the country. It's not that contrarian. Right. I've heard you say that before. So, it's it's kind so, of funny. Silicon Valley felt really contrarian. Yeah. But um, but so that's that's sort of why you know if you're if you're doing something that half the country agrees with you on. Um, that it's kind of weird for that to be beyond the pale. I mean, maybe it is. That's actually that's, hilarious. That's, Supporting that's really Trump crazy. was your least com contrarian move of, of sure, the last sure. twenty it was, years. It was, it was it was in a way the least contrarian thing I've done, and so so uh, it it uh, it it's kind of um, you know. Uh, but but there is something about um, the politics that's intense. It um, it's felt zero sum for a long time. Um, and, and you know it is polarized. It's extreme. We don't know what the answers are, and so there are there are ways that it's been um, you know it's been weaponized that are that are not always not always healthy. So yeah. I I uh, you know I, I don't think we're gonna go back to the status quo ante. Unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, that's just it's sort of gone with the wind. It's mm -hmm. not, we're not going back. You know, it's uh, and um, and it's it's quite possible we're gonna you know have sort of you know ever more intense politics for quite some time. You know, one of my colleagues coined this term about a decade ago. That um, you know, it was, uh, I think it was the John uh, Jim Cramer, the crazy uh, person on CNBC. Yeah, yeah. He has this line where there's always a bull market somewhere. You have to just look for it. You have to know where to find it. And you know, and then the bull market. Uh, my colleague suggested uh, this was around 2008 that was getting started. Was a bull market in politics, and uh, which is not a, not necessarily a place where you want there to be a bull market. But uh, but I think I think we are. In a sort of bull market in politics, and uh, and it it still has no end in sight, 
and, uh, and we're, and we're going to be looking for um, options that are further outside the box, and, uh, and the debate may be, it may be even more intense in the, in the years ahead than, it has, that's, than it's been before. All right, I think that's enough about Trump for now. I have a feeling he'll probably appear again. But uh, let's talk about sense making because Eric Weinstein, mm -hmm. who uh, I guess is the architect of the intellectual dark web, who is the, what is his title? He is the managing director of Teal yeah, Capital. Yeah, yeah. Sort of man of many hats. A man of many hats. Okay, so one of the ideas that he has discussed many times in this very studio is that what's happening right now is that our sense making, our communal sense making in America is just failing. That our ability to trust the media or CNN or New York Times or the rest of it has failed to the point that this intellectual dark web, this crew of about 20 or so people, uh, are the last bastion of our ability to just make sense of things, or at least try to make mm -hmm. sense of things. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of questions on this, but first, Eric works for you. You guys have major disagreements. He was a Bernie guy. You obviously supported Trump. Uh, I'm sure he's been on these shows and talked about probably policies that you don't agree with and things like that. Yet you let this guy do whatever he wants. I, I think that's a great credit to you, but why, why do you do it? I mean, why do you let this guy run around and, and do whatever he wants to do, even when it's in conflict with what you believe? I don't well, think most people would do that. Well, I'm, I'm interested in ideas always. And uh, I think that uh, I don't think all the ideas are, are just the conventional ideas. I think there are, um, I, think that, I think we need to find new ideas, new ways of approaching the world, thinking about it. And, um, and Eric is certainly, you know, absolutely first rate heterodox thinker and uh, and you know I, I don't think you know I think all of our politics are somewhat eclectic and somewhat complex and you know and uh, you know Eric's more on the left I'm more on the right but uh, but uh, we're, we're both interested in ideas we're interested in figuring out how to make sense of our world and uh, and that unites us and, and and it's always surprising how that's a pretty unusual place to be there that yeah it's it's, it's much of it's not about ideas. It's as we said earlier, it's about power or fashion or, or something like that. But, but most guys in your position wouldn't be allowing one of their, their top people to be out there often taking positions that are against them. That, there's something about you that's allowing you to do that, right? You know, I... I, I know I you don't, don't want to, I know I don't, you don't don't, sit here and pat yourself on the back, I but I, I think it's an I, important piece of something. I think, um, and I'm not sure I'm right about this, but let me, let me, let me be a little bit more modest on this, but um, I think most most uh, of my peers in Silicon Valley um, think that the ideas are are more set. We, we sort of know all the right answers, and it's inefficient. It's a waste of time to be exploring outside of that. And and so the the sort of the substantive question you have to ask is, are the ideas right, or you know, should we have more exploration? So it's like you know, if you take the take the climate change debate. Mm -hmm. There's there's a view that you know. We know it's happening. Oh, we here we go, to you. <laughs> We know that uh, you know, it's a runaway problem, and um, and uh, and if we, we we can't we can't even pause mm -hmm. and think about it because we know all these things. We have to just focus all our energy on on solving them. And so, if those things are true, then that might be reasonable. If they're if they're not entirely true, like maybe you know, maybe maybe climate change is. Maybe it's more methane than carbon dioxide, in which case maybe uh, eating steak is worse than driving a car. So maybe, maybe climate change is a problem. It's a little bit different from the way we think it is. And so if, if these things are not true, then we need to have much more of a debate. And so the, the kind of question that's very hard that you have to have, make some judgment on is, do we more or less have the truth about everything or don't we? Yeah. And my view is that we're like really far off. And I think a lot of my peers think, you know, you were, we're kind of at the end of history. We sort of figured everything out. There's, we don't want to be long ideas. We don't want to be, you know, interesting, weird ideas are just wrong and they're just a waste of time. And that's, that's sort of their, their bias. Mine's the opposite. Yeah. Do you think that this set of people, and I think I would include you in that in, in a broader sense, I mean, now you're, you're sitting here and doing this, um, do you think we have a chance of resetting some of this stuff? I mean, I think that just if you look in the last week, I mean, Alan going on, Rogan, you sitting down mm -hmm. here, Again, without patting myself on the back for a moment, like I view that as like a landscape change of the way people uh, that are our influencers, our visionaries, are reacting well, to I think, media. I think, uh, yeah. I, look, I think, look, I think the boxes are too narrow. 
you know, it's like one, one it's like, we, you know, it's like the baby boomer since 1968. They've been relitigating 1968 for 50 years. And we've had like, you know, it's the same fights, they're getting kind of old, but it's been, been Groundhog Day for 50 years. And, um, and, uh, and, and maybe there's something past Groundhog Day. And that's, that's the bias you have, that's right. the bias I have. <laughs> right. And, uh, and I think part of it is, um, it's, it's not just talking about talking about ideas, it's, it's, you know, it's bringing forth some specific ideas. These are things that are different, that are changing, that are, you know, that where the world may look very different in the future from where it looks in the present. But I, I think we're not at the end of history. We're not at a time where ideas don't matter or where people can't do things. I think the future will be very different from the present. Maybe it's going to be better. Maybe it's going to be worse. It's up to us. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm super long uh, having a, a very broad conversation about things. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought up the baby boomers for a moment, because it does seem like that partly what's happening here is that they're at their last grasps of controlling mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And in an odd way, Gen X, my generation, got, which I think you're, you're probably mm -hmm. at the right at, around the, a little bit ahead of me on Gen X, that we sort of got lost. And yes. then we, it's like almost like we handed everything off to the millennials, but we didn't give them any of the tools to be able, they were too young and didn't have yes. the tools or the, or the financial instruments to be able to yes. make any change. Does that, does that make well, sense? Well, there are, there are a lot of strange generational dynamics one could, uh, one could talk about. I've, I've been very struck um, in recent months in thinking about this, how there is something very odd in terms of what happened to Gen X, um, which is people born say 1965 to 1980 mm -hmm. as the birth years. Uh, boomers were sort of 46 to, to 64. Yeah. And, uh, and somehow, you know, the boomers dominated things like crazy. And, uh, and there was, uh, we were sort of like in the shadow of these people um, and, and in all sorts of different, uh, in all sorts of different contexts. And uh, you know, it, was, it was, Gen X was probably the first time that you had a generation that was smaller in numbers than the one that came before us, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the, the, it, it sort of coincided with an era of you know, slower growth, slower progress. So there were sort of fewer opportunities to rise. Uh, you know, the baby boomers held on to their positions, and it, in some ways, you know, it was like when I when I started working at a law firm in Manhattan in the early '90s. I mean, I, was, I wasn't thinking of it consciously this way, but it was the baby boomer partners. They just become partner, and they were sort of pulling the ladder up behind them. Mm -hmm. And it was going to be much harder for people in my generation, our generation. To, to do the same things, to go down the track in the same in the same way, and so there is something you know there is something very weird about how um, how Gen X has gotten um, you know ha has been sort of sidelined by the boomers for so long. Yeah, and then the you know the rap on us um, is always that we're you know we're too uh, too young or too old, <laughs> right. right? And so we were you know in the '90s when Gen X was starting the tech companies. Uh, we were seen as too young. Mm -hmm. We needed adult supervision. We needed the baby boomers to, to run the companies, and that's and almost every Gen X uh, founder, and some exceptions, but um, overwhelmingly the boomers took over the companies. Hmm. There was a version of this with Yahoo and eBay, uh, Netscape, um, even Google, which was the biggest of the Gen X companies. Um, uh, you know, you had a 10-year period where Eric Schmidt, the baby boomer, took over uh, took over Google, whereas you know the boomer companies, Apple. Microsoft, um, uh, Amazon, um, Microsoft and, and Amazon, Amazon were just the same people got to run them the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Apple's a little bit more chaotic. Facebook, millennial company, they got to run it. Gen X, uh, not so much. Do you think that's I, I think I think one could, and, and, and tech is like meritocratic. It's not supposed to be about right. culture and voting and stuff like this. Um, and then I, th I think, um, I think on, a po on a political level, it's striking how underrepresented we are. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, 2020 should be, should be a prime year for a Gen X mm -hmm. presidential candidate on the Democratic side, someone mm -hmm. born between 1965 and 1980. And I challenge you to name me a, a single plausible Gen X uh, Democrat. Like, don't pick a loser like Cory Booker. <laughs> Right. I mean, that's the thing. Well, I think there's several reasons for that on the Democratic side. But They've gone they, off so they, the deep they, end on it's, it's somehow the boomers, there are more of them. And so they, they, they look like it's, it's truth in numbers. And it's, the, the baby boomer bubble, in a way, has always been that the numbers make it right. That if yeah. you have a lot of people, it's true. And that's kind of what worked. And so, you know, it, 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 the boomers were this unusually big generation. And it was just about them. It's just about getting consensus. And then you could overwhelm things. And that's... 
that's what you had to do. Hmm. And I think that's, that's sort of coming to an end slowly. I wonder, do you think there's also just a flat out technological component to this that we in Gen X, we're the last generation that grew up without all of mm -hmm. this tech. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the exact connection is, but I remember mm -hmm. being in college, I think my freshman year, I remember some kid down the hallway mm -hmm. screaming, I'm, I'm on the internet. Mm -hmm. And I went into his room, I've told the story a couple of times, I went into his room and it said Yankees three, Royals one, and it had two pictures of the logos. And I swear on my life, I remember thinking this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Like we did not grow up with the mm -hmm. phones in our pockets. We didn't grow up connected, all of those things. So it almost seems to me there's some connection to that where then the millennials came in, they were mm -hmm. so connected to all of this. Then the media, because the media mm -hmm. wants clicks and everything, paid so much attention to them that that maybe pushed out Gen X a little bit more. Do you, you think there's? I'm just I'm just doing this. You know, sort of out the like top this of sort of head. cultural history. It's always many variables, yeah. and super overdetermined. I I do think there's there's um, there's something about the millennial vibe that feels more conformist. Yeah. And Gen X feels less conformist. And and so uh, and so one of the you know, good and bad things about being overly connected, overly technologically connected is, you know, you get to you get to know the score right away, you get the answer right away, you know you're supposed to um, be scared of climate change right <laughs> away, um, and that's good if it's true, ah. and it's bad if it's a shortcut. And so our generation, you could say, was the last one where, that didn't take shortcuts. And most of the time, you're, the boomers learn to take shortcuts. We you know, we didn't take as many shortcuts. Ah, I like that. Millennials know to take all the shortcuts. And um, it's a good idea to take shortcuts in a world where nobody takes shortcuts. Um, in a world where everybody takes shortcuts, um, you know, you have to actually figure out, maybe the shortcut isn't gonna work and, and you're actually better off figuring out the other thing. Yeah, so I think, oh, I love that. So, so one way to frame this would be in the, in the boomer era, um, the boomers who figured out how to take shortcuts. So the shortcut in politics is, I'm not gonna figure out what I think about the issues, I'm just gonna look at the polls. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm the pollster is the one who's really running for president, and we're just listening to the pollster. And that was, that was an effective boomer technique for many years, that you just look at, at the polls. And if you, were, if you had a better pollster, you could more quickly get to where the puck was going, where the crowd was going, and you didn't need to think. You didn't need to waste time thinking about stuff. And so in a world where very few people are doing it, that could be a very good strategy. By the time you get to the, something like the millennials where everyone's been trained to do shortcuts, that it somehow doesn't quite work. It, it vaguely maps onto the tracking because you can think of tracking in school, tracking professionally mm -hmm. is a way to, it's like a shortcut to a successful career. And so the baby boomers who stayed on track did quite well. So if you didn't you know, tune in and drop out and the late 60s and just went to law school and you became a partner in a law firm, that it kind of, the tracks worked. Mm -hmm. By the time we get to the millennials, they know all the tracks you're supposed to do. Tracks work less well when everyone knows them. Every, everyone's doing the same thing. So it has, there, there's sort of, there are these similarities between the millennials and the boomers, but the lesson, they're, 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 um, they're really different in practice and it's working really differently. So the, the things that would have worked perfectly for you as a boomer are, are deadly if you're a millennial. Yeah, so okay, so hearing that and knowing that our sense making is breaking down and our mm -hmm. ability, even our ability to just get away from all of this, mm -hmm. what you said before about you know paying that much mm -hmm. attention to politics and all that, everyone asks the whole IDW crew constantly, well, what are you guys gonna do? And you just said something about, you know, we shouldn't just talk about these things, we gotta mm -hmm. do things. Do you see either a technological answer here or a business answer here or Something, and I, we've talked about this a little bit privately before, and it, we've kind of bounced it around, but like, everyone wants some answers to, to what's going on here with the media and, and everything else, and, and, and the pipes, you know, that Google owns all the pipes, and yes. all of that stuff. Yes. And I think a lot of people, yes. the default position yes. is, well, Teal will fix it, because well, it's like there's only a couple people that actually could. Well, it's, it's um, I, don't, I don't actually quite know what one does to, to fix the, the media industry. Um, I, I would say the, um, the thing that I'm always super fixated on is the business model question. So you know, my, yeah. my zero to one uh, book, uh, the, you know, so the main motif is always um, that you shouldn't compete, 
you should try to have a monopoly. You should try to do something that you do so well that you have no competition. Mm -hmm. And you know, there, there are good and bad things about monopoly, but from the inside, you generally want to have a monopoly. It gets a little bit bad if you become too fat and, and lazy, and um, and uh, if you then ever have competition, you're really in trouble. And um, you know, in a way, the the business history I would tell of the um, the mainstream media is that they used to have great monopolies. Um, the newspapers had local content monopolies, and they got local monopolies on advertisers because the only way you could advertise was through you know, the classified section of newspaper or news magazines or you know there are all these sort of um, all these sort of media monopolies. And um, what technology, what the internet has done, is it's 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 opened things up in ways that are good for information for for learning things, but it's it's very bad for their business models, and uh, and I think this is something they they never really understood, mm -hmm. and so if you were you know if you were at the Washington Post in the 1990s, you know if you sort of imagine what the holiday party would have been like, um, you know the the owner of the Post would have said something like you know um, you know we're all we're all getting paid, you know we're doing great, business is doing great. We have all these talented people that are writing great stories, and so the narrative would be that it was a great business because of um, the great work the people there were doing. And the true story was something like, uh, "No, you're working for a utility company, <laughs> and it doesn't matter what you do because we'll we're going to make these monopoly profits uh -huh. year after year after year." And then when the monopoly story started to break, um, the story was not. The monopoly's going away because they can't talk about that. Right, right. But the story was rather, um, we don't, uh, we don't know anything about the internet or something like that. Right. And so I think, I think the the challenge that uh, a lot of the media, old media businesses have, haven't even been described correctly. Mm -hmm. And then you know, and then it, it's, but then it is, you know, it, it sort of, it sort of plays out in, you know, um, in, you know. It, and, uh, and, and you have to figure out some new ways to get distribution channels, some new ways to monetize. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are, there, I, I think there will be models for doing that, but that's the, that's the question, how to do it. How do you, you know, the, you can't go back to the old monopolies though. Yeah, we, we need some answers. All right, let's, let's shift a little bit to some, of your, to some of your history because I think a lot of people, or a certain set of people, probably only know you through the, the Gawker prism. And every time I read anything about Gawker or what happened with you or Hulk Hogan, it, it always seems so distorted the way they present it, which is probably very obvious to you. Um, but to me, it was like you weren't people, because people will say, well, Teal hates the media. He, he sued a publication. He obviously hates the media. And it's like, actually, you were defending the right to privacy, which mm -hmm. is something that the media should be doing in and of itself. Um, what made you want to get involved in this? You had your own history with Gawker, obviously, before Hogan yes. and all that. Yes, and it's, it is, you know, there are all these elements of the story that are, of course, you know, sort of a little, little bit larger than life, where you have sort of the sociopathic uh, um, um, Manhattan um, um, media company, and I think that's a too kind of characterization. <laughs> our, 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 um, our internal code name for, for Gawker was the MBTO, the Manhattan-based terrorist organization. There you go. Well, and, you've likened them then, to Al Qaeda before, right? And then, um, and then, uh, yeah, it was it was it was some. It was a crazy story in '09 where they you know, just completely distorted things. And I was speaking to a reporter at the San Jose Mercury News, and, uh, and like, what do you think of them? And I said, oh, they're the Al Qaeda of Silicon Valley. And yeah. oh, can I say that? And, yes, <laughs> yes, you can. And uh, because of course you can. You can. Um, but uh, but the the um, the uh, uh, and so I, th I think they they were sort of this. Uh, and it, it, it was in some ways, um, there are all sorts of things you can say about it that were kind of crazy. You know, it's, it, it was super destructive. They went, mostly they didn't go after people like myself. They went after people who were relatively powerless, mm -hmm. you know, often just average people, not public figures in any sense of the word. Um, you know, Hogan was sort of an in-between person. He'd been like a very high profile celebrity, but um, was definitely, uh, it was definitely beating up on a weaker person in a, in, a, in, in, in the context in which they they did it, and mm -hmm. so it had uh, it had this sort of heroic underdog fighting this um, this sort of um, hate factory, yeah. this hate factory machine. That's could, the right way to describe it. Get, get yeah. targeted at uh, at various uh, at various people. Um, you know, 
um, you know, we have a First Amendment, uh, and you know, I, I believe in I believe in freedom of speech. Um, you know, uh, and you have, of course, always you know the the the, the Hogan trial, uh, the, the you know the jury trial. In a jury in a trial, you can always argue the law, or you can argue the facts. So the the uh, the Gawker side argued the law, which is you know we're there's a First Amendment and it's sacred, and we're journalists and we get to do whatever we want. That was sort of that mm -hmm. was roughly their argument. Um, the uh, the Hogan side of it was you published a sex tape that was secretly taken in the privacy of a bedroom, and those are the facts. That has nothing to do with the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. It might have something to do with the Fourth Amendment, which is against unreasonable search and seizure, uh -huh. not just by government but also by, you know, private people, obviously, and um, and uh, and uh, and so you know, and so yeah, is there a conf Can there be a conflict between? Uh, freedom of speech and, and right to privacy. Probably there are cases where in theory there can be conflict, but this was one where it was simply a violation of privacy, and I would say it, it wasn't speech at all. And then, and then you know, and you know, sort of all sorts of like super, you know, egregious facts that came out in trial. You know, one of the, uh, one of the uh, reporters, uh, the, the editors who had posted the sex tape, um, you know, he, uh, he had a deposition with, uh, with the, uh, with the, um, uh, it was a one day long deposition a few years before the trial and and uh, it was you know you sort of you have a lunch break you come back after lunch and uh, AJ Delario came back reeking of marijuana which uh, you know not not against it but I would I wouldn't do it on your show I wouldn't yeah. do it in the middle of a, of, of a legal deposition either yeah and then um, uh, um, you know the lawyer on our side asked uh, asked Delario is there any sex tape you wouldn't publish I said, well I guess it involved a child and it was like what age child a four-year-old, uh -huh. and so you know, when you show that to the jury, that's that's pretty devastating. And so it it was one of these things where, um, you know, we th I, I thought that if if Mr. if Terry Bollea Hulk Hogan if he ever had his day in court, it was going to be a runaway effect. Mm -hmm. It was going to be completely runaway, um, and uh, and that's 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 in effect what happened. You know, the last day of the trial, uh, Charles Harder. Um, so, you know, he thought he thought that the largest amount of money he could ask for with a straight face was one hundred million dollars, uh -huh. and then you know after seven hours the jury comes back with one hundred fifteen, and so it was just it was just it was just a runaway thing, and it was you know maybe it was you can you can argue that it was too much for this one person, but in some ways it was it was you know it was a million posts they they published over the years that were that was what was really at stake right well i think a lot of people the people that that like you and defend you on this will say well this was a defense uh, actually of free speech it was a defense of just the the media coming after it, everybody finding out anything you've ever done finding out any access to any picture you've ever sent or or any of that and we see the way this is this well, is sort of infecting everything in society again, this, right is, now. Like, this is a not that simple argument to make, but, but the way I would argue is I think, I think we need to have vigorous debate. We need to have people with heterodox views be able to articulate things. And, um, and you, know, you can silence uh, people by not letting them speak, but you can also uh, silence them by if you say something that's even slightly out of line, we are going to send the hate mob after right. you and we're gonna make up stories about you and, uh, and, and, and personally destroy you. And in a way, that was the logic of the, of the hate factory, of the scapegoating machine that was Gawker. It, uh, you know, in, in some ways, the victims were picked at random, and in some ways, they were not at random. In some ways, they were the nonconformists. They were the people with, um, with uh, views that were, were sort of heterodox. I, I suspect that's one of the reasons they, they targeted me. And again, I, I was not targeted more than some other people hurt even more than I was, but uh, yeah. but it was it was it was very often people who said things that were just a little bit outside the zone, and then they were destroyed. And the lesson was was one of silencing. Yeah. So we should talk a little bit about them targeting you. So so they they in effect they outed you, right? I mean, is that were they officially the ones that that outed you? You know, I don't. I, don't, I, I think even that history can be sort is of. It, Contested, since. right? I mean, I know you were out privately, and, and all so, that, I so think, it's hard to say. So I think it was it was sort of a, it was in a somewhat in between zone. Um, they they targeted me repeatedly over years. So it was it was that it was you know it was it was various other articles on the um, and it was of course uh, if we talk about outing, it's it's never 
it's never a simply factual thing. Mm -hmm. It's never, oh, um, Peter or David are gay, um, FYI. <laughs> it is, um, it's more like uh, Peter Thiel is gay and we have no idea why he didn't want us to talk about it. Right. And uh, maybe it's because, maybe it's because his parents don't know and they'd be embarrassed or maybe it's because he's trying to get money out of Saudi Arabia, and uh, and uh, got to be those. But two. we don't really uh, <laughs> we don't really know why. Yeah. And so um, so outing is always uh, the the way it worked. I think it happens actually much less. But the way it worked um, always involved a description of someone's sexual orientation and a description of how psychologically messed up they were. Right. Because they didn't want you to write the article. And uh, the way I think our society has progressed is that the, the word we have for outing today is something like bullying. Mm -hmm. And the question has shifted from the psychology of the person being written about to the psychology of the writer. And the question is, why would you, why would you do something mm -hmm. as nasty as this? And so there was... So that's so, a pretty powerful so there's been, thing. There's been a very big cultural shift. Yeah. And so in 2007, when they, when they, um, when they went after me, outing was still acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, in 2015, they went after the CFO of Condé Nast. Um, and, you know, again, sort of, who knows if the story was even true. Right. But, um, uh, but uh, the response was, well, it's an incredibly vicious thing. Why are your reporters so vicious? Why are they so hateful? Um, what's wrong with you to be? And it, it was sort of like linked to bullying, high school bullying, all, all, these, all these kinds of phenomena. So, so we've, so I think I think uh, I think things, you know, I think we have actually progressed. You know, transparency doesn't always mean that you make things better. It, it's it's sometimes it's just it's just an, you know it's a, just an excuse for for attacking people. Do you think that in your case that it was also directly linked to your politics? Because if you had been the exact same person you are with the exact same resume and had created the exact same companies, but you had been a lefty, you had been playing ball the way that they want you to play ball, that, that why would they try to harm you? I mean, in effect, they were trying to harm you one way or another. I think that's why they, they do these things. That's why the, the label bully is applicable here. That to me, it's like, well, he's the libertarian. He's some scary anti-government guy. So how can we get him? Let's out him. Do, do you think that's a fair estimation? You know, it's, it's probably a factor. It's hard to, you know, I think, I think on some level, they were just trying to get page clicks. It's just something. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, um, we're still, I think this, you're being too charitable to them in a way because <laughs> you're um, giving them an ideological motive. And you're saying, okay, <laughs> they were these principled left-wing people who went after uh, the bad right-wing power structure. Yeah. Not necessarily principled, and, but yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and I think they weren't even, they were more nihilistic than liberal or left-wing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you, know, you, could, you could dress up the nihilism. We're gonna blow somebody up we're gonna do some crazy um, attack on some random person and we're gonna try to give it some thin ideological gloss. But I think it was just, it was just, uh, you know, it was, it was like, it was run as like this crazy sweatshop where, you know, the, the, uh, the people were paid very little and they were paid based on how many clicks they got. And so you had to come up with crazy sensational headlines and then stories that, uh, you know, sometimes had a relationship with the truth and sometimes didn't. Yeah, and that has really permeated the internet altogether. Now, I mean, if I look every week, you know, I'm on tour with Jordan Peterson, it's like every morning I wake up and it's like somebody writes something awful about him that I know is not the truth, and it's like they have every interest in doing it because well, he I, will defend himself, thus driving clicks. Although, I, you know, I will still say that I, I think Gawker was, in some ways, a singularly sociopathic mm -hmm. bully. And, uh, and it is true that there's a lot of stuff uh, uh, like what you, you characterize, I don't think, um, I think people discount it more. It has less impact. I think, you know, in its heyday, Gawker had impact because they were, they were sociopathic, they were bullying, and people didn't see it yet. And that's, that's the devastating kind. Yeah. You know, if, you're, if you try to bully someone and everybody says right away, you're a bully, uh, you might still be a bully, but not as, not, you're not gonna be that effective. Right. Um, if you're bullying people and say, oh, this is just the internet, this is tech, this is the future, you're gonna have carte blanche. And so Gawker had carte blanche for many years um, to destroy people in a way that I think um, has gotten much less effective. I mean, it still happens, there's still, you know, you can have the 
hate mob form on Twitter. There's sort of still versions of this, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's much less generative. All right, so let's, let's talk about sexuality for a little bit, because this isn't something that you talk about that often. We, we've talked about it privately a little bit. Um, well, you, first off, you're married. Congratulations. You got married in the, in the last year. How much of your sort of contrarian view of the world, just the way you see things differently, do you think is linked to being gay? Because before just the last couple of years, where I think being gay has been so attached to leftism, mm -hmm. gay used to mean fun or different or politically incorrect mm -hmm. and making edgy jokes and, and mm -hmm. being at subversive clubs or all, all of these other things, whatever it was. Uh, and gays were really about the individual. That was the whole point. Um, you now are sort of, as I said at the top, kind of the ultimate contrarian, and I wonder, is there a link between that and sexuality, do you think? I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to exaggerate any, any such link. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I think of myself as like, there were sort of, um, I'm always bad at autobiography, so I'll start yeah. with that as a qualifier, <laughs> but uh, I always think of myself as somehow, I was both um, a total insider and a total outsider. So it's like, you know, straight A student, you know, on, on the elite university, elite law school, elite law firm track. Um, you know, I was a bit of a nerd. I was, um, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was born in Germany, sort of immigrant to the U.S., uh, um, you, know, so, you know, the gay thing. So all these, so all these ways that I was sort of both an outsider and insider, and probably there's some way, yeah, some way all this stuff, you know, summed up to, to, um, make me less less prone to just b believing in the received wisdom. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I, 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 wouldn't, I, would, I would certainly not want to say anything remotely like that, that uh, gay people have a privileged access to the truth or, or, or anything like that. That's, that, that. That seems kind of crazy. Okay, so a couple of years ago, you go to the Republican National Convention and uh, you talked about being gay, which had always been anathema over there. What, what was the exact line that you had said? Well, it was, uh, I'm proud to be gay. I'm proud to be a Republican, but most of all, I'm proud to be an American. And, uh, and so it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, and so I think it functioned in both a way that, uh, you know, every American has an identity. It's, uh, it's not something we should ignore or totally diminish, and we should not make it all important. And it was sort of trying to steer a certain, you know, middle course on, on, on identity politics. Where so where you know it's, uh, and I think it's very easy to go too far in one in one direction or another. You can you can say that, you know, um, that all identity is fake. It doesn't matter. It's all made up, and that's I think that's that's wrong. I think there's an African American experience. There's a female experience. There's a gay experience, and and they are they are different. And then um, and then of course there's, you know, an equally bad mistake of of, of making it all important, uh, where you know. That's all there is. That's what defines you, and then it ends up becoming more of a straitjacket. So you know, the or the, the gay the gay metaphor that I've used is that you know, um, you know, you can be in the closet, you can be in the ghetto, and they're those are um, they're mutually um, exclusive, but I hope they're not exhaustive. <laughs> the, that there's Which, some, something in between, right? Because those two are pretty exhaustive. Or something that's actually. neither neither of those two. Yeah. So when you so said that, I don't that want to be in the closet. I don't want to be in the ghetto. Yeah. So when you said that line and then got that ovation, first off, were you were you nervous to say that line? Because that that's no small feat just to have it in the speech and ready to go. And you were, land you were nervous and, to speak. You know, it was just you know, it's like speaking to fifteen thousand people or whatever. It's kind of a strange, you know, super adrenaline type experience. Yeah, but, but that particular line. I mean, when you got the applause on that, there must have been some part of you that was like, it worked, or 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 something has changed, or yeah, something. Yes, like that. Oh, I, you know, I. Again, I, I don't think I don't think the Republicans um, are that anti-gay. I don't think they're that anti-gay. Yeah, I, I don't and, think so either. And I mean, I think maybe that maybe they were in the past, uh, uh, but uh, but but it was it was clear that this was not the issue. This was not the hill they wanted to die on in 2016. And so somebody had to say it. Yeah. So it and must so be. I, it, it, you know, it it felt a little bit risky, but I, I don't even want to exaggerate that. Yeah. I, think, I think it would have been a very crazy thing to say 20 years earlier. Yeah. All right. 
let's shift to some new ideas. How about, how do you feel about that? Absolutely. Let's do some new ideas. So seasteading is one of the things that you've been interested in for years. This idea that we're gonna basically create in effect, states that are going to be on platforms in the sea that I think are sort of going to be libertarian utopias, or at least that would be the, the general idea. Um, seems like it had a lot of uh, momentum behind it for a while, then kind of went away. I think there's some renewed interest in it now. What got you interested in this, and well, it where was, is it at now? It, um, it was uh, Milton Friedman. I, I sort of knew Milton Friedman a little bit, and his grandson, Pat, Patrick Friedman, mm -hmm. um, I sort of got in touch with. and. Um, and he was super, he sort of spearheaded this uh, seasteading idea uh, probably about a decade ago now. And it, it, it was sort of a creative, different, interesting idea. You know, I gave it a small amount of funding. It wasn't one of the things I did that much with, but it, it somehow hit an incredible nerve. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I think it's, and it hits such a nerve because, um, you know, this idea of starting a new country or doing something new, um, it reminds people that uh, um, if we had to design a country from scratch, we designed the state of California from scratch, it would be so different. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, there's sort of all these sort of super corrupt governance institutions we'd clean out, and we'd, uh, you know, th um, and um, and so it's uh, you know I'm not sure I'd call it utopian, but it's a it's a thought experiment that uh, that uh, gets that energizes people and gets them. To think about things, I, I spoke at this um, free market university in Guatemala years ago, and um, um, uh, they told me that the, uh, they had free speech on everything, but the one thing that you weren't allowed to speak about were things like seasteading or starting <laughs> new countries. And, and the reason you weren't allowed to speak about them was that if you started, people wouldn't want to talk about anything else. Right. And it's because um, it's because it's it's always such a such a powerful hook. And you know there are there are questions about whether it will be allowed. So you have to sort of get probably some, some local permission. There's a question on um, how technologically feasible it is. Um, there's sort of a pilot program that uh, they're working uh, with French Polynesia and starting. It's you know, still somewhere in the, you know, in the intermediate stage. But uh, yeah, you can pr perhaps, you know, if you can get, um, if you can get um, political autonomy, um, the, the assumption is you would do things that are very different. You might do medical tourism, you might do, you know, there might be all sorts of offshore banking you could do. There'd be sort of all kinds of things that one might be able to do differently, and um, and the you know the the link to uh, the link to to um, to technology that uh, you know those, the, you know if, I mean I think you saw, you know you'd let a lot of these different microstates bloom and you'd sort of see what would come out of it, but the the specific technological scientific technological uh, thing that I think could come out of some new political arrangements at some point is always this question. Whether um, we could get new medicines, new drugs, um, um, you know, um, could you have something where you know you use um, psilocybin or MDMA as a antidepressant drug, mm -hmm. um, or can you get uh, can you get new um, can you get um, new medical treatments through where you sort of break the FDA monopoly on on medicine worldwide. So basically you would see all of these different units sort of having different rules that they live by kind of as an experiment to see what would work, is that? Um, that's, that's one level, but yeah. then the, the specific thing that I would, so yeah, that's, that's the general abstract level. But the yeah. specific thing that I, I would hope would come out of it would be more scientific and technological progress that's too heavily regulated mm -hmm. by the heavy hand of our existing state and that there are all these things we can't do. So there's you know, all sorts of things of governance that might be better. You might have you know like a different penal system, where you don't have you know millions of people who are incarcerated. There are all sorts of things one might do very differently. The the specific one that I that I'm probably most attracted to is this is this question of whether we can do new biomedical things. Yeah. So all right, we could do three hours just on this, but so only one more question on this, which is how do you decide who gets in on this? How do you decide who can who can live there? Who can be part of this? I mean, is this purely a financial move? If you've got enough money, you're good to go. Or, or do you are you trying to build a society and and picking all sorts of other people and and all of those things? Well, you get you get get you get to make all these decisions. You get to make these decisions. You get to make these decisions, and that's uh, and uh, that's, but I think that's that's always you know that's always sort of one of the foundational decisions in a society who who's part of it. How do we define it? And um, and you know it's it can be unfair and oppressive if um, if 
you have just one society, and if you're not in it, you're nowhere. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you have if you have many of these places, that's that's very different. Yeah, and uh, so the pushback on this is then that that somehow this means you don't like America or something like that, which is. I uh, n uh, no, but I, I I certainly think that if we have competition governance, okay. we we could we would do a lot better. Yeah. All right. So, let, let's talk. So, let's move yes. then. So, uh, flying cars. Alan is against them now. He's building an underground tunnel in this very city. Where are you at on the flying cars these days? Well, so we had the we had the it was a tagline we had on our um, on our venture capital uh, website. Uh, um, you know, they um, they promised us flying cars, and all we got was 140 characters. Right. So sort of a, We've got 280 now. Uh, yeah, but, <laughs> all right, we got up to 280, and um, and so it was it was it was uh, it was more a commentary on. Um, on uh, technology that we were we were promised these massive breakthroughs that would transform the way the world works, and then that we got uh, sort of incremental communication technologies, but not not world transforming. And so I do think flying cars would be, you know, would be a good thing. I know I think Elon's objection was they were too too noisy, and then of course the question is, can you design them okay. so they're not so noisy? So there's always you know, so what are the, what are the actual limits on on the technology? But the um, but uh, they're, they're sort of iconic for, can we have a Jetsons future? Uh -huh. Can we have a future where things look really different? And the, the striking thing is that we live in a world that doesn't look that different from the 1980s. Again, the, the, you know, we're, we're looking at screens, you know, we're distracted by our iPhones all the time, but um, the iPhones that distract us from our environment also distract us from the way in which our environment strangely hasn't changed. We're running, we're, you know, maybe riding on a hundred year old subway in New York City, mm -hmm. or, you know, the, um, the zoning laws mean that the cities like San Francisco look like they haven't changed in 50 years and are not <laughs> right. that technologically advanced. San Francisco is getting so expensive, you had to leave. I mean, that's, well, that's something. Not the, not the precise reason, but, <laughs> but, um, but, but it basically, uh, so, so it, it's sort of like, can we, can we have more technological progress than we have? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, the the the, um, the sort of iconic image I always have of this you have the two Back to the Future movies. The first one they went from eighty five to uh, nineteen fifty five, mm -hmm. and things had changed a lot from mm -hmm. nineteen fifty five to nineteen eighty five. The second one they went from nineteen eighty five to what they thought twenty fifteen would be like, and you were going to have like I mean, all it was going to be like this crazy different world. And I think the reality is the world of twenty fifteen uh, looks you know much. Less different right. from the world of 1985 than 85 was from 55. I'm still so, waiting for that hoverboard. What happened to the hoverboard? All, all these kinds of yeah. things. Yes, <laughs> and so it's uh, and so there is sort of this this this, um, and I think that you know one of the one of the ways our society works, one of the ways um, liberal democracy or representative government works, is that you have a scientific technological progress going on in the background. You have growth. The pie is growing. If the pie grows, we can find creative ways to um, to shift the pieces so that everybody gets more. Um, when the pie stops growing, when there is no progress, then you end up with this polarized world with these zero-sum politics. Uh, you know, for every winner, there's a loser. Anyone who succeeds is suspected of being part of some kind of a racket or something. And um, and so I think I, I I think there is actually you know a pretty uh, um, there's a link, a pretty deep link, between this, uh, the question of scientific and technological progress and uh, the health of our sort of representative democracy. Yeah, so all right, that's a good segue to, to AI, because we've talked about this a little bit, and you told me something once that I, I, I'm actually not sure if you've said publicly, but I think it's pretty on point, that basically if you're an authoritarian, you should be for AI, and libertarians are sort of against AI. Am I am I getting that roughly correct? Yeah, I think this. this I think you did the, it a little the, better. The soundbite was on. It was on Bitcoin. So yeah. it was, if, if crypto is libertarian, yeah. then AI is communist. So everyone it, thinks of uh, crypto as libertarian because you have all these ideas about decentralizing money and things like this. Nobody says AI is communist, <laughs> and that's because we're sort of we're more conscious of people with different views, like libertarian, and we're less conscious of people with collectivist views because that's sort of the that's more the zeitgeist. Right. But uh, but yes, I think AI, um, you know, it, it, and, and the the crypto versus AI dichotomy goes to the sort of question about what's the future of the computer age going to look like, and um, 
and is it going to be more centralized or more decentralized? And we had, we had, you know, if you think about the history, we've had these very different pictures. So, you know, in the, in the late 60s, the early Star Trek episodes, you had maybe there was one planet they got to where there was one big computer that ran the whole planet, had been running it for 8,000 years, and uh, you know, people didn't have any thoughts. They were all sort of docile, kind mm -hmm. of happy. Nothing ever happened. And that was what people thought the future would be in the late 60s, it was going to be centralized, big computers. The late 90s, um, it was going to be crypto, it was going to be decentralized, the internet was going to you know, split up all these sort of structures. If you, and it was like 1998, let's say, so let's say 68 was centralized, 98 was decentralized. 2018, in some ways, the pendulum has swung back to centralized. It's big governments, big databases that can monitor and uh, survey people and know more about you than you know mm -hmm. about yourself, or thing, things like that, sort of creepy big brother type thing. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think since the pendulum has swung back and forth so much over the last 50 years, there's no reason that that's the future. And it's, it's, it's actually a choice. Do we want it to be centralized? Do we want it to be decentralized? And um, what, what I think, again, AI can mean many different things, but um, if it means that you have large databases that are controlled by, let's say, a large government that can monitor people more effectively. You know, it's something that could make uh, communism maybe more effective, certainly more scary, more totalitarian than it ever was in the uh, in the 20th century. And then the, and I, I do think you know it's not a coincidence along these lines that the Chinese Communist Party hates crypto and loves yeah. AI. Huh. And and again, you know, they they. AI means something a little bit different from what it means in a Silicon Valley context, where in Silicon Valley, AI often just means, you know, a, um, a super smart computer that will leave all the humans behind. <laughs> in China, it means a, um, a uh, really smart computer that helps a few humans control the rest. Yeah, so it almost seems like we're going to splinter off into two versions of this, where we'll have these two tracks that'll be side by side. Half the people are really going to be into this sort of centralized idea of things and the ease that AI will allow you to get products or whatever mm -hmm. else it is. And then you'll have this other group of people who maybe, who are into all the cryptocurrencies and all that, who are just sort of, I don't know, I suppose operating outside of the system or, or well, something it's, like that. it's, you know, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's possible these things can be overlapping, but it's also possible it can go much more one way or the other, mm -hmm. that it can be ultimately, that the future can be more decentralized or more centralized, it can be more capitalist, more communist, more libertarian, more totalitarian. So, um, so I think uh, it can go in you know, a lot of different ways, and, it's, and, and this is why these debates are important, because it's you know, up to us to decide you know, which technologies do we push and uh, which ones you know, are we, are we maybe you know, um, going to be a little bit more careful? And I, again, I don't think you should outlaw AI or regulate it, but yeah. uh, but I think that uh, um, that uh, that uh, there certainly are other technologies that I would like to do better. So I know you're not in the well. What are some of those technologies? Well, again, right? something like crypto. Yeah, so, so crypto, so crypto being the, the, the main the, one. The co contrasting example here. Yeah. So I, I know that a huge percentage of my audience, just because they know of all the craziness I've been through with demonetization, and I'm always complaining about the algorithm and our videos not going to feeds mm -hmm. and all of these things, and that we've just sort of we just don't know what's going on. You know, and mm -hmm. you know my feelings on this about I don't want the government telling these companies what to do. But I would like a little more transparency out of the out of the mm -hmm. government. I'd like to know what's kind of going on with the algorithms and mm -hmm. things like that. Is there any way we could know more about these algorithms and things that are giving us all this information, or is that just there, there's reasons why we can't know all of that? I'm not even sure you if know, I framed that question correctly. You know, look, I, I have to, so I've always level. had to be careful here since I'm on the Facebook yeah. board, and um, and I I I certainly think that. Um, uh, uh, in, my, in my judgment, uh, um, you know, Facebook has been given a bit more of a bum rap than it, it deserves on, on on many of these scores. But uh, but I, I would say that uh, that I think um, there is this this question is going to continue. It's uh, it's you know, does is Silicon Valley discriminating against certain voices? Is it um, are the algorithms in fact neutral, or are they coded to discriminate against? Um, conservative, libertarian voices that are out, a little bit outside the mainstream. And I think Silicon Valley is making a mistake if it thinks that that question can be sort of swept under the rug and is, is going to go away. I think, I think the question is going to be asked with, uh, with you know, more intensity in the years ahead. 
And I think people are, they're gonna have to answer it. Yeah, all right, so two more for you. Did you ever think if 20 years ago someone would have said to you, you know, Teal, in 2018, you're gonna leave Silicon Valley, and not only are you gonna leave Silicon Valley, you're gonna go to LA for freedom. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're gonna go to LA to escape, to find some free thinkers. Now, there's something interesting happening in LA right now, and it goes to something that you referenced earlier. Politics and media are sort of becoming one thing, and there is suddenly this new home here of kind of free thinkers that are interested in politics and all that. But the fact that you ended up here, of all places, where this is thought of as Hollywood and the, the liberal lefty elite and all that stuff, does that seem crazy to you that of all places you're gonna end up here? Now I know the yeah, way it is. I, I, I don't think I would have predicted it 20 years ago, certainly. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, think, uh, you know, I think there's sort of a lot of different reasons one uh, chooses to live in a place. I, I probably like bigger cities. As, as I think there's sort of a lot, a lot of things you can do in big cities you can't do in, in smaller places. One of the one of the things that, however, is a very different feel between Los Angeles and Silicon Valley um, is that uh, Los Angeles is, it is a weirdly, it is the big city that is weirdly decentralized. And, you know, it doesn't have a center. Um, you know, people always complain about how bad the traffic is. But uh, one of the virtues of it is it's, it's somehow, it isn't, it isn't like this, uh, this intense manic uh, bubble like Manhattan or like uh, San Francisco and Silicon Valley have become. And so um, the, in the super intense network effects you have in Manhattan and um, in Silicon Valley um, can be very positive because it's like you sort of communicate things, you get ideas, but then at some point you get a tipping of point gets crossed where it goes, where it becomes more negative. It becomes groupthink, lemming-like behavior, the madness of crowds. And, uh, and my judgment is somehow uh, Silicon Valley is, you know, jumped the shark just a little bit over the last few years that, uh, that uh, the very things that were positive got pushed so far till um, they actually became poisonous. Yeah, do you think you get more support privately from some of your colleagues than maybe publicly on, on something like that? Like were people, other CEOs calling you and going, you know, I get it too, I'm having trouble hiring qualified people because of all of Oh, absolutely, I mean look, there's, there's, a, there's an economic, there, look, there are a whole bunch of reasons. I mean, there's, yeah. there, the, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 the the reductionist economic reason that uh, things have gotten less desirable in Silicon Valley has gotten too expensive. You know, if it's two thousand dollars for a one-bedroom apartment, maybe that's like a boom town, and that's showing things are going well. If it's four thousand dollars, <laughs> that's like just a crazy tax right. that um, maybe you should think twice about paying. Yeah. And so, um, so yes, I think that uh, yeah, even on the nuts and bolts, if you're if you're starting a new company, um, you know, five six years ago. It was clear in tech that Silicon Valley was the right place to do it because of all the network effects and you had more capital and more talent and that, that sort of helped. Today I think it's much more ambiguous. It doesn't mean it's all going to move to LA or all going to move to some other place. I think, I think it's going to be much more decentralized. Um, you know, and it, it, is, it is actually you know, one of the very strange um, ironies or paradoxes of the internet age that it was supposed to, the internet was supposed to eliminate the tyranny of place. Yeah. And, um, and that it all, most, almost all of it happened in this, uh, in this narrow Silicon Valley area. You know, there's a, I remember there's a talk I gave at uh, Stanford University, it was sort of a panel discussion in, uh, two, back in 2005. And uh, one of the questions was, um, where will we find the next Google? So it was a sort of student audience, the student union at Stanford, and it was sort of a, and so they, they were interested in working for the next Google company. So it was a search problem. Mm -hmm. searching for the next Google, can't type it into the Google search engine, but, <laughs> but it's really valuable to figure it out. Yeah. And I sort of thought it, the sort of clever, slightly cryptic answer I gave was, you know, I think there's a 50% chance the next Google is within a five mile radius of this room. So, it's, um, so I'm narrowing the search problem. Five mile radius was about maybe roughly a millionth of the uh, surface area of, of, of the Earth. So I was reducing it by a factor of a million, the search uh -huh. problem. Still pretty hard, a lot of garages and things you have to look at within a five mile radius. Um, and I think that was actually right. It was that concentrated. So, wow. you know, the next Google was Facebook and it was 1.8 miles <laughs> from that room. And so, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but that was, it was correct. If I had to give the same speech today, it would be, it would be uh, way less than 50% within 50 miles. Wow. And so I think, I think it is going to be much more decentralized. So yeah, the consensus is total centralization. 
And um, just as with AI and crypto, I'd be more on the crypto than the AI side. In general, I'm, I'd be much more on the decentralization than centralization side. So I know you haven't been here for that long, but do you think that there's been any costs that you maybe didn't expect, like that there's something going on there still, there's some still, still some spark of something that maybe you won't have access to enough or be around as much or something like that? Do you think there's any risk there? You know, I think, I think I'll have access to, to, to the same the same set of things, but I think I think I think I think it's just getting a little bit. Um, the outsider perspective is healthy. Yeah. You know, and uh, and you know when we when we initially uh, set up my office, we were you know in San Francisco, which was a little bit outside of Silicon Valley for many years. So um, so I always think you want to be you want to be um, you know you want to be not in the middle of the insanity. You don't want to be totally in the boonies. Right. You want to be somewhere in between. Right. And uh, and I don't I don't think LA is totally in the boonies. All right. Well, <laughs> well where I live might be not you know. All right. Um, okay. So one more for you. So you know I've been on this tour with Jordan Peterson for the last couple months, and you know I'm. It's so interesting because I go online all day and there's people yelling at each other and seemingly hating each other, and then I spend my nights with thousands of people who are coming together over ideas, who may disagree on this or that, but really want to find some answers. So as someone, one of the few people now that I think is, is trying to find answers, that is actually making sense, that, that really wants to look at different ways to solve the problems of the day, for the young people that are watching this, you know, take anyone under 30 that's watching this and wants to feel hopeful, because that's the other part that I think is changing. There's a huge amount of people that don't feel hopeful for the future. Mm -hmm. They feel our political establishment is just at, a, at odds. They, they feel this constant hate online. For those people that want to feel hopeful, what, do you, what can you give them that they can look to for a hopeful future? Well, it's, it's always hard, it's always really hard to give, you know, it's always really hard to give um, generic advice. And I, I'm I not always, going for generic and advice I always, here, I always feel there's so, there's so many things you can say that just sound like, you know, like BS in a way. And that's, that's, that's why this is actually uh, a simple but difficult question in yeah. a way, a very hard question in a way. I think, um, you know, the autobiographical part that I, I tell about my history was that, you know, I was, I was super tracked. You know, it's like eighth grade, junior high school yearbook when my friend says, you know, I know you're going to get into Stanford in four years. Four years later, I get into Stanford. I get into Stanford Law School. I end up at a top tier law firm in Manhattan. And it was, you know, one of these places on the outside, everybody wanted to get in. On the inside, everybody <laughs> wanted to get out. And, um, and the, the sort of, uh, the sort of a quarter life crisis. I didn't never had a midlife crisis, but I had maybe a quarter life crisis in my mid twenties. And the quarter life crisis was, um, you know, why did I end up in this? What 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 did I do? And I think it was that I I just followed the track and I, I wasn't thinking about you know why I was doing things, um, what I was doing, and 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 I think that's that's sort of that's the generic advice is that. Um, the tracks are not working. Um, maybe they, maybe they worked. I think they worked better in the past. They had problems, but they worked better. They, they worked. They stopped working for Gen X. They're working even less well for millennials or Gen Z or whatever is next. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's um, And so it's more important than ever to um, to think for yourself, to find something you're good at, you're interested in, you're motivated at, and and do it. The um, you know the, the again the generic. The, you know, somewhat, well, actually, just across the board advice I always have is not to be overly competitive. That the, you know, the tracks force you to compete. Mm -hmm. So you compete, you win, you cycle and repeat. And, uh, and you need to find something where, you know, you're not always just looking at the people around you and uh, you have some, some other reference point. Um, you know, this is sort of more of a, of a, of a religious cut on this, but uh, I'm always struck um, by how, um, you know the Ten Commandments. They're they're sort of uh, they're kind of um, the, the the first and last in some sense are maybe the the, the important ones, the the end end ones. The first one is you should only look to God. There's only one God, and you should worship Him. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is you shouldn't covet anything that belongs to your neighbor, or and so uh, that you shouldn't look at the people around you too much. And um, and so we need to find some way to look up, to look. And not to look around, because when we look around, it um, it's uh, it's not that we figure out what we what to do. It just ends up being 
the hyper copycat, mimetic, crazed environment. And that's, uh, so it's, it's always, there needs to be more of a, you need to find some transcendence. I think this is, you know, this is what, this is what's powerful about the Peterson message. It's, you know, it can't just be fashion. It can't just be what everybody thinks because that's just, uh, you're, gonna, you're just gonna be competing with people like crazy. Yeah, there's a literal metaphor here in that we're always looking down on our phones while you're telling us to look up. So. Or, yeah, we, 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 yeah, we, we don't, but we, we're always, we're looking too much at the people around us. And we're, you know, and, 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 uh, and it's, it can be efficient, it can be a shortcut, and then at some point it can just be a trap because, you know, if it's, it's like the, you know, the, the, there's a business school example I often give where you can think of a business, Harvard Business School or any of these business schools as hothouse environments in which you have a bunch of people, they have no transcendent reference point, they, they, uh, they have no idea what they want to do, they're all sort of extroverted, they all spend two years talking to each other about what to do. They don't have any ideas. And there's almost a um, dynamic where you end up with uh, the most faddish the, and the most wrong idea being the <laughs> consensus choice for, uh, for so many of these people. And that's, that's always a dynamic to, to try to avoid. Yeah. I don't know how to end an interview better than that. I'm, I'm so glad that we finally got to do this. You know, I was thinking before I sat down with you, where do I point people to with Peter Thiel? And I could point them to your companies and everywhere else. But then I thought, you know what? The guy's only tweeted once, and that's probably the best place I could point people to because these days everyone's fighting on Twitter and you only tweeted one time. So I'll look at the camera, follow Peter on the Twitter, at Peter Thiel, unless you want me to point them somewhere else. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> it's I'll been a pleasure, my friend. Thank you very much. All right, thanks a lot.